The story commenced in the magnificent Ceylon Kingdom, Yulan City, basking in the radiant sunlight between majestic mountains. Within the Feng House, one of the four prominent families in Yulan City, chants filled the air during martial arts training at the training ground. A master led a group of students, instructing them to repeatedly focus on their waist movement. Among the students, one expressed his unwillingness to train and complained to another student named Feng Lei. He pointed out that another student, Feng Hao, enjoyed a privileged position within the family and avoided such rigorous training. Feng Lei agreed, claiming that Feng Hao had relied on numerous miraculous pills yet had only achieved the third level of martial arts. Feng Lei believed that Feng Hao was no match for him and dismissed him as a waste, unworthy of mention. The other students gathered around Feng Lei, aligning themselves with his views. They encouraged him, saying that other families closely observed their entire family and that cultivating the Feng family technique was crucial. They saw Feng Lei as the family's only hope and the responsibility lay on his shoulders. The trainer, noticing the students gathering around Feng Lei, expressed his disapproval by smacking his whip on his hand and sternly instructing them to continue practicing. Meanwhile, Feng Hao bathed in the bathroom in a firm smoking elixir mixture. He sat in meditation within the elixir, surrounded by its fumes. Feng Hao's talents were considered mediocre, but he had access to the best remedies and resources of the Feng family, isolating himself from others. However, unknown to everyone, the medicines did not affect him, and he sat in the dark elixir mixture to test his true capabilities. An old servant was beside him, monitoring the elixir's effects in the bathtub. The servant explained that the bathwater mixture contained dozens of precious medicinal materials to improve toughness and achieve a body upgrade. The servant inspected some of the medicinal materials in his hand, confirming that they had turned into dregs as expected. With a disappointed expression, the servant asked Feng Hao if the restorative materials still needed to be absorbed this time. While dressing up, Feng Hao expressed his frustration that the elixirs still did not affect him causing them to disappear entirely after entering his body. He deemed himself a waste and told the old servant not to waste the family's resources on him anymore. However, the servant insisted that Feng Hao was the only son of the master and should not speak of himself in such a manner. With determination, Feng Hao declared that he wouldn't give up, swearing by the name of Feng Hao that he would never fail the family's expectations. He went outside to practice, fed up with people calling him a waste. He believed he could conquer nature and decided to work harder than others. While practicing, Feng Hao heard strange sounds and called out, but no one answered. He wondered if it was just an illusion or if someone was indeed behind him. Suddenly, Feng Hao heard the sound again, and this time, he turned around to see a scary voodoo mask staring at him. The encounter terrified Feng Hao, and he screamed in fear. However, it turned out to be a girl wearing the mask, Wan Xin, silently observing Feng Hao from behind. Feng Hao was surprised to see her, noting that he didn't expect her strength to surpass his in just two years. He laughed, but with a hint of jealousy. Feng Hao admitted that he had stagnated all those years and was now working harder. Wan Xin reassured Feng Hao, telling him not to be sad and that she believed in him. Feng Hao brushed off his feelings and asked Wan Xin why she wasn't practicing at this hour and how she found him. Wan Xin revealed that Master De Ying of the Feng Yu Martial Arts School had accepted her as a disciple. Given her talents, Feng Hao was genuinely happy for her and encouraged her to study there. Do you want to know the name of this manga, along with all the manga names of the recaps we did in our channel? How about also the chapter numbers our recaps end? You can simply ask the names in our Discord community for free, or become a donor, to get them all in one place. You can either be a donor in Patreon, or be a member in our YouTube channel. Just scan this QR code, or go to the link in the description, to become a donor. Moreover, becoming a donor automatically makes you a VIP member of our Discord server, with over tens of thousands of members. With a smile Wan Xin shared the most important part of the news. She promised to give Feng Hao a chance to interview, which meant he might have the opportunity to join the Feng Yu Martial Arts School with her. Suddenly they heard a voice saying that the Tianwu continent had always valued strength and Feng Yu's school wasn't open to anyone. Wan Xin recognized the vote, the martial arts master, Dei Ying. Dei Ying emphasized that the only way to enter the school was by proving oneself at one of the best schools in Tianwu. She added that he could still become strong even if Feng Hao started with low training. However, Dei Ying mockingly referred to Feng Hao as the well-known waste of the Feng family, suggesting that he might not be suitable for the school and should stay in his own country. Upon hearing this, Wan Xin pleaded with De Ying, insisting that Feng Hao's current state was only temporary, and that he possessed great talent. She implored De Ying to give him another chance. Feng Hao placed his hand on Wan Xin's shoulder, signaling her to stop. With a hint of anger, Feng Hao declared that he would enter the martial arts school with his strength, unlike some people with low talent who weren't even worthy of interviewing him, let alone being his teacher. He openly mocked De Ying, provoking her anger. De Ying, now furious, proclaimed that Feng Hao was just a crazy kid and that he needed to be beaten to realize how weak he was. Seeing De Ying angry and emitting powerful energy, Feng Hao admitted she was trying to kill him. 
Dae Ying attacked Feng Hao but blocked it with his cross fists. While blocking her attack, Feng Hao understood he didn't want to die, he wanted to become stronger. Meanwhile, Dae Ying felt her chi being drained from her body as Feng Hao continued to absorb it. She panicked and tried to escape, but their bond was now so strong that she could not break free. Dae Ying desperately yelled at Feng Hao to stop warning him that he might die if he absorbed too much of her chi. However, Feng Hao was now consumed with fury, and his eyes glowed red as a golden energy aura surrounded him. Di Ying became frightened, realizing that Feng Hao's body seemed like a bottomless pit, and if the chi absorption continued, she might die. Finally, Di Ying decided she'd had enough and mustered her strength for a decisive break, destroying the chi transfer bond and sending Feng Hao away. The impact of the holiday was devastating, and Feng Hao spat out blood from his mouth as he landed. Wan Xin was deeply worried about Feng Hao's well-being, unsure what might happen to him. Meanwhile, Dae Ying was still shocked and amazed by what she had witnessed during her encounter with Feng Hao. She tried to explain to Wan Xin that if Feng Hao hadn't lost his mind just now, she might have been in grave danger. Dae Ying needed clarification about comprehending the extraordinary abilities of Feng Hao's body. Wan Xin, deeply concerned for Feng Hao, asked Dae Ying if he was dead. Dae Ying assured her he wouldn't die, but she reiterated her warning to Wan Xin not to have any further dealings with Feng Hao if she wished to become her disciple. Meanwhile, Feng Hao lay on the ground, blood still coming from his mouth. He found himself in what seemed like another galaxy, surrounded by planets and stars emitting tremendous energy. Feng Hao sensed a heavy feeling in his body, questioning if he was dead. He felt like something was about to burst from inside him, causing him to fear his body might explode. Feng Hao noticed two holes in his body, one in his stomach and the other in his chest. The chest hole began to emit vital yellow energy, intensely painful for him. He was bewildered and struggling to understand what was happening to him. As the yellow point separated from Feng Hao's body, he screamed in agony, unsure of what was happening. The power started interacting with the other stomach hole, and Feng Hao feared that his body was on the verge of exploding. Suddenly, the stomach hole burst open and the yellow energy took on a distinct form, revealing a face. It expressed gratitude for finally being released after hundreds of years of waiting. With a smile, this energy entity thanked Feng Hao for the chi he provided that day. Confused and overwhelmed, Feng Hao asked the energy who it was and why it had been inside him all this time. He questioned the purpose of this energy residing within him and consuming his chi. The entity responded authoritatively, stating that Feng Hao should be grateful for the chance to serve him. It explained that the yellow energy had allowed Feng Hao to change his life against all odds. Shocked by the revelation and the possibility of changing his life, Feng Hao was filled with conflicting emotions. He questioned whether this mysterious energy had been inside him all his life, and whether it was the reason behind his lack of progress and the insults he endured. In a burst of anger and frustration, Feng Hao confronted the energy entity, blaming it for his struggles and demanding it leave his body. With a scream, Feng Hao awakened in his room, realizing it was all just a dream. His mother was beside him, holding a tray of soup. She asked if he was awake, and mentioned that he had fainted from practicing too hard. After eating the soup his mother brought, Feng Hao reflected on how Dae Ying had knocked him down. He asked his mother who brought him back, and she informed him that it was Master Dae Ying of the Feng Yu school who sent him home. She advised Feng Hao to thank her next time, but he refused, believing that it was likely Wan Xin's request, and that he didn't want to thank someone like Dae Ying. At that moment, Feng Hao's father entered the room and advised him not to be impulsive. He reminded Feng Hao that Wan Xin had been accepted as a disciple by Master Dae Ying, which was a significant event in Yulan City. Feng Hao's father, as the master of the Feng family, advised him not to lose his etiquette. Feng Hao remembered when Dae Ying insulted him by calling him trash and he disapproved of her. Feng Hao's father placed his hand on Feng Hao's shoulder and told him that although he didn't know what happened, he should remember that the men of the Feng family would never bow their heads to others. Feng Hao assured his father that he would keep that in mind. At the meeting, all the elders of each clan were gathered and engaged in conversations. They expressed their surprise that the first one to enter Feng Yue Martial Arts School was a girl from the Wan family, and congratulated Wan Xin's father on having such a promising daughter. Wan Xin's father, sitting beside a master, boasted that his son was also a talented individual in their generation, and would likely be admitted to the school sooner or later. Da Ying agreed, saying that it was natural for every member of the prominent families to excel and be selected for the school. However, just as Da Ying was speaking, an announcement was made, declaring the arrival of the Feng family. Feng Hao and his father entered the meeting, and Feng's father apologized for being late, and congratulated Wan Xin's father. Wan Xin was also present and excited to see Feng Hao looking well. Noticing her excitement, Wan Xin's father scolded her, reminding her that she was a student of Feng Yu school, and should not be in any relationship with someone like Feng Hao. He asked Wan Xin to come to him and started to pay attention to her identity. Hearing Wan Xin's defense of Feng Hao, her father became even angrier and confronted Feng's father, demanding that he takes care of his son and stops harassing his daughter. He warned that if Feng's father didn't do anything about it, he would teach Feng Hao a lesson. Wan Xin's father criticized the reputation of the Feng family, calling them delusional. Meanwhile, Da Ying also noticed Feng Hao's presence and didn't seem pleased to see him there. 
she launched an attack with wind blades on Feng Hao, hitting his knees to provoke him. However, to everyone's surprise, Feng Hao remained strong and stood tall, fighting back with a determined look in his eyes, showing no fear of death. Feng Hao's father, Feng Chen, also noticed his son's resilience and questioned why De Ying attacked him without reason. Before Feng Chen could finish speaking, De Ying's wind blades became even more powerful, and Feng Chen could not defend himself as he was too weak. The other clans present watched the drama unfold without intervening. Seeing this, De Ying mocked Feng Chen, calling him a waste like his son. Feng Chen, unwilling to back down and determined to protect his family's pride, declared that he would engage in a one-on-one -on -one duel with De Ying. However, De Ying was quick to attack, stating that if Feng Chen wanted to die, she would gladly help him achieve that. Wan Xin pleaded with her master to show mercy and not harm the Feng family. Wan Xin was ready to sacrifice herself and block De Ying's attacks in a desperate attempt to protect Feng Hao and his family. Seeing this, Feng Hao became furious and was prepared to confront De Ying head on. He shouted at her, reminding her of what happened the previous night and warning her not to forget her loss so quickly. De Ying sensed the powerful energy inside Feng Hao's body and realized he could control it. Feng Hao, however, managed to control his temper and avoid losing his composure in public. Dei Ying decided to spare the Feng family this time, but she warned Wan Xin that they both possessed the ice physique, so she accepted her as a disciple. She added that if Wan Xin continued to act this way, she should not blame Dei Ying for being merciless. Hearing this, Wan Xin's father apologized for his daughter's behavior, attributing it to her youth and ignorance, and requested forgiveness on her behalf. As the discussion continued among the leaders of the other families, they acknowledged that Wan Xin's possession of the ice physique body granted her immense potential and strength in the future. They believed that individuals with exceptional physiques like hers would become the strongest. However, they also took the opportunity to mock Feng Hao, deeming him useless and incapable of achieving greatness. Meanwhile, Feng Hao was still seething with anger over the humiliation he and his father faced at the hands of De Ying. In his furious state, he challenged De Ying, admitting that he may not be her match now, but he vowed to repay today's disgrace with interest in three years. De Ying found his challenge amusing, pointing out that it took her six years to become a great martial master, while Feng Hao, who had struggled for so long in the lower stages of martial arts, wanted to challenge her in just three years. She laughed at the idea, considering it crazy, but she agreed to his challenge, saying that if he could defeat her by then, she would admit defeat. Later in a barn, Feng Hao recalled the family elders' words, who were spreading rumors that the Feng family was nothing but rubbish. The elders' comments about Feng and his father losing face and the impact on the Feng family's reputation weighed heavily on Feng Hao's mind. Feeling sad and worried, Feng Hao approached his father, Feng Chen, and apologized, blaming himself for being useless and bringing disgrace to his father. His anger and frustration were evident as he clenched his fist, causing blood to flow. Feng Hao swore to wash away today's disgrace in three years for the sake of his grandfather. Feng Chen, his father, comforted him and assured Feng Hao that it wasn't his fault. He expressed his belief in Feng Hao and emphasized that his son had always been his pride. With these words of encouragement from his father, Feng Hao was motivated to prove himself and change his life around. Resting in the field, Feng Hao contemplated the world's emphasis on strength and how it could lead to obtaining everything, including dignity and respect. Suddenly, Feng Hao heard a voice and became curious about its identity. The entity, however, advised him to refrain from searching for its source since it resided within him. This revelation made Feng Hao realize the energy monster was still inside his body. Feng Hao addressed the inner voice, acknowledging its impact on his recent display of power against De Ying. The spokesperson confirmed that it was responsible for the surge of strength, but dismissed any gratitude, stating that it had existed within him for a long time. The inner voice then proposed coming out of Feng Hao's body to assist him in becoming more muscular. It claimed that if Feng Hao wanted proper strength, it could help him harness its power. However, Feng Hao sternly replied, demanding that the inner monster leave his body immediately. He was upset that the beast had been consuming all the medicinal resources meant for his cultivation. The inner voice, not backing down, reminded Feng Hao that he possessed the virtual martial arts physique, which inherently required rigorous and continuous practice to progress. It admitted to taking the medicinal resources, but it emphasized that his body hindered swift advancements, not the actions of the inner monster. Hearing the term virtual martial arts physique shocked Feng Hao as he finally grasped the reason behind his slow progress. Despite his relentless efforts in training, the inner voice continued, explaining that the most significant characteristic of the virtual martial arts physique was the inability to gather qi effectively, resulting in a slow progress rate. The voice continued, explaining that the Yan Jue technique was designed for those with the virtual martial arts physique. However, it warned Feng Hao that the more influential the skill became, the more dangerous it would wield as it could be deadly when practiced to its complete potential. Undeterred by the risks, Feng Hao declared that he would still practice and become strong. He was willing to give his all and face any danger to overcome his weaknesses. Feng Hao saw himself as the pride of his father and was determined to live up to his expectations. 
The energy monster acknowledged Feng Hao's resolve and decided to teach him. However, it cautioned him not to be scared by its appearance. As the energy monster emerged from Feng Hao's body, the two holes reappeared on his chest and stomach, causing intense pain. Feng Hao regretted his decision, fearing the energy would tear him apart. Finally, the energy monster fully emerged, and to Feng Hao's surprise, he saw a small and cute girl in front of him. The girl introduced herself as Lao Lao, but she instructed Feng Hao to address her as Master. She wore a smile on her face and asked Feng Hao to kneel and show respect to her. Feng Hao was taken aback and utterly confused by the unexpected sight before him. He felt the weight of the accumulated pressure bearing down on him and decided it was best to retreat and rest for a while. As he rubbed his head to clear his mind, his gaze fell upon a book lying on the ground. To his astonishment, it was none other than Zuan, the highest grade skill in Yulan City. Perplexed by its presence there, Feng Hao wondered aloud how such a precious skill like Suan could end up on the ground. At that moment, Lao Lao, who had been searching for her misplaced low-level technique used to cushion the feet of a table, spoke from behind him. She revealed that she had lost her practice and was looking for it. Seeing an opportunity to seize the precious book, Feng Hao decided to act swiftly and lunge toward it. However, before he could reach it, Lao Lao noticed the book and quickly picked it up. Consequently, Feng Hao fell to the ground in his failed attempt. Lao Lao, seemingly unaware of the actual value of the book, innocently explained that she had been using it to make tea. This response only infuriated Feng Hao, who sternly demanded that she stop joking with him. He explained that there were three types of secret scripts on the land of the Tianwu continent, Forging Body, Wu Yuan, and Martial. The Forging Body skill was meant for refining the body of practitioners, while martial artists used Wu Yuan's secret method to control their internal energy. The particular confidential process a person selected would determine the amount of Wu Yuan they could master, and once chosen, it couldn't be changed. The strength of martial arts plays a crucial role in one's power, as high-quality martial arts could enable individuals to unleash explosive abilities. The three types of secret scripts were categorized into five grades, ranging from the lowest to the highest. No Grade, Yellow, Shuan, Earth, and Heaven. Each step was divided into three levels, Low, Medium, and high. Upon realizing that his family's martial arts were merely low-level yellow grade, with the highest being yellow grade high level, Feng Hao felt a mixture of shock and disbelief. However, his astonishment grew even more when Lao Lao suddenly produced dozens of yellow high-grade books, claiming they were merely for her tea-making purposes. The discoveries left Feng Hao utterly flabbergasted. In a gesture of deep respect, Feng Hao showed respect to Lao Lao and expressed willingness to endure any challenges ahead. He felt honored to become her disciple and asked about her true identity. In response, Lao seemed delighted and declared herself Feng Hao's master. Feng Hao found it puzzling how a master could behave like a child. Nonetheless, Lao Lao told Feng Hao he didn't need to know her real identity. She affirmed that she was his master now, and he must focus on learning Yan Jue to fulfill their three-year agreement. Feng Hao stood with deep respect before Lao Lao and inquired about practicing Yan Jue. Lao Lao replied that he should first learn the skills from the secret script and focus on improving his physical body before attempting Yan Jue. She warned him that opening the virtual martial arts without sufficient preparation could be fatal. Feng Hao respectfully agreed to follow Lao Lao's instructions. A few days later, Feng Hao diligently practiced alone. As he contemplated that he was learning a Xuan grade skill, he found the breathing technique from the Tiger Moving Chapter incredibly challenging. Observing him struggling, some other students commented that it might be because his father was no longer the family leader. They mocked him, calling him a waste and asserting that he was not worth their time. As the students left, a sudden surge of energy hit them from behind, and they turned to see someone achieving a breakthrough. Smoke filled the air as Feng Hao stood, realizing he had unexpectedly reached level 3. He was amazed that his master hadn't deceived him, and he had indeed made such a rapid advancement. Witnessing Feng Hao's breakthrough, people started discussing how it seemed impossible for him to progress so quickly. Soon, the martial arts trainer arrived and instructed all the students to continue their practice. Meanwhile, he couldn't help but think that he should inform the new leader of the Feng family about Feng Hao's impressive progress. The trainer stood before the elders and revealed that Feng Hao had achieved a breakthrough during the morning practice. Hearing this astonishing news, all the elders, including Feng Chun, were amazed and shocked. The older leader inquired if any other remarkable phenomena were involved in Feng Hao's breakthrough. The trainer explained that Feng Hao's practice skills in the martial arts training ground differed from the usual techniques. Hearing the word different, Feng Chun was taken aback. The trainer continued, stating that Feng Hao's practice techniques allowed him to simultaneously exercise physical toughness and strength control. He speculated that Feng Hao was likely practicing a high-level skill of yellow grade at the very least. The revelation stunned all the elders, particularly Feng Chun, who found it hard to believe. The Feng leader confirmed that within the Feng family, only one yellow-grade high-level secret script existed, solely for martial use. 
he decided to inspect Feng Hao's techniques to verify the claims personally. Feng Chun couldn't help but think that Feng Hao must have received guidance from one of the elders. Meanwhile, Feng Hao, amid intense practice, was sweating and breathing heavily. He focused on perfecting his striking technique in martial arts, and his energy seemed to radiate powerfully. Observing this transformation, the other students began whispering among themselves, wondering how Feng Hao suddenly became so fierce. Some even speculated that he might use a yellow grade or high level technique. The Feng leader arrived and acknowledged the possibility of Feng Hao's techniques being a yellow grade secret script. However, he informed Feng Hao that he would assist him in changing the family's master before making it public knowledge. The Feng leader asked Feng Hao to accompany him and keep the matter confidential. Witnessing this, Feng Chun felt a surge of pride for Feng Hao. Feng Hao sat on a rock and called out to Lao Lao. Lao peacefully slept inside him and wondered why Feng Hao disturbed her rest. Feng Hao explained that although Lao Lao had granted him powerful skills, they were exhausting and he needed time to recover before continuing his training. In a drowsy state, Lao Lao replied that Feng Hao's body had natural limitations and couldn't handle the constant strain. Feng Hao acknowledged Lao Lao as a clever master. While half asleep, Lao Lao mentioned pharmacists and asked if Feng Hao had heard of them. Feng Hao confirmed that he had heard rumors about pharmacists in his city. Lao Lao explained that in the land of Tianwu, alongside martial arts practitioners, there were two other prestigious professions, pharmacists and poison masters. The pharmacist's role was the noblest, focused on treating illnesses and injuries. No matter how high one's cultivation level was, one would inevitably face hurt. And without a pharmacist, those injuries could prove fatal. To become a pharmacist, the first step was to possess a pharmacopoeia. Following the records in the pharmacopoeia, one needed to ingest various medicines and condense their effects within the body. This process qualified them as a pharmacist. However, producing pills required massive resources, making it feasible only for large families in prominent cities. Pharmacopoeias were considered precious treasures and were usually passed down through generations. The pharmacist's level was closely linked to the quality of their pharmacopoeia. In contrast, poison masters practiced poison secret scriptures and created lethal poison pills. They were regarded as the most dangerous and feared individuals on the mainland. Offending a poison master often led to a terrible fate as they could administer deadly poisons. Upon hearing this, Lao Lao questioned why pharmacopoeias and poison masters were so rare in their era compared to the past. Lao Lao then mentioned that she wouldn't be using these methods and instead offered Feng Hao an immortal pharmacopoeia scripture, which would spare him from unnecessary trouble. Astonished, Feng Hao looked at the immortal pharmacopoeia in his hands, both amazed and shocked. Upon seeing the immortal pharmacopoeia in his hands, Feng Hao felt excited, envisioning himself as a legendary pharmacist. To his shock, he eagerly opened it, but the pages were blank. Frustrated, he closed and reopened it, only to find the same emptiness. He accused Lao Lao of playing a joke on him. With a sleepy expression, Lao Lao replied that only those with a virtual martial arts physique could read the immortal pharmacopoeia secret scripture. Feng Hao insisted he possessed the virtual martial arts physique but couldn't see anything in the scripture. Lao Lao advised him to drop some of his blood in the center of the picture and concentrate on it. Confused but willing to try, Feng Hao bit his finger and let the blood drop onto the scripture. Suddenly, a burst of energy emerged from the scripture, and Feng Hao found himself inside his mind, surrounded by all the writings of the scripture. Having absorbed all the pill recipes into his mind, Feng Hao found it incredibly convenient. Whenever he focused, the pharmacopoeia's knowledge was readily accessible to him. Still half asleep and clutching her pillow, Lao Lao warned Feng Hao not to show off his newfound low-level understanding to her. Undeterred, Feng Hao expressed his desire for higher quality herbs and elixirs to make pills. However, Lao Lao refused, stating that the medicines were merely snacks for her. In response, Feng Hao felt disheartened, thinking that the pharmacopoeia now had no use for him. Lao Lao chastised him, remarking that the requirements for the Xu Dan in the pharmacopoeia were not high. Though it provided only a low-level recovery effect, it was sufficient for Feng Hao's physical strength. Determined to find the Xu Dan, Feng Hao closed his eyes and searched for it within the pharmacopoeia in his mind. Upon locating it, he called out to Lao Lao, but she had already vanished, as she often did. Accepting this, Feng Hao decided to buy the ingredients for the Xu Dan the following day. Now, at the market. Amidst the bustling market, shopkeepers were loudly advertising their wares. Feng Hao approached one seller and informed him that he had only 50 gold. He requested three strains of kingling grass and two feet of fire cloud vines. The seller recognized Feng Hao's face, and despite the original price being 80 gold, he agreed to sell it to him for 50 gold. Feng Hao expressed his gratitude to the seller and prepared to leave. However, as he departed, someone in the crowd recognized him and exclaimed, Isn't that Master Feng Hao? A group of students gathered around him, asserting that he was no longer the young master since his father was no longer the leader of the Feng family. The group leader, Yang Kui, who was at the fourth level of the martial apprentice, admitted that he had not heard the news and thus misunderstood Feng Hao's situation. He sneeringly referred to Feng Hao 
as the abandoned son of the Fung family. The news quickly spread through the market, and bystanders began discussing the potential quarrel between young Master Fung and Master Yang. They wondered who would come out victorious. Feng Hao was shocked at the situation by everyone talking about him. Feng Hao responded calmly to Yang's provocation, diverting the attention from the tense situation. He inquired where he could purchase leashes for dogs, remarking on people's incompetence in allowing four dogs to roam freely in the market without leashes. His witty remark elicited laughter from the onlookers, causing Yang to lose face. However, Yang was infuriated by Feng Hao's words, interpreting them as an insult. He angrily confronted Feng Hao, challenging him to a fight. In a burst of rage, Yang lunged at Feng Hao, launching a powerful punch. But much to the surprise of the spectators, Feng Hao effortlessly sidestepped, avoiding the attack with ease. Despite Yang's status at the fourth level of martial apprentice, he couldn't land a single strike on Feng Hao, who seemed to dance out of his reach. Undeterred, Yang attempted another attack, but again, Feng Hao's agility allowed him to evade the blow effortlessly. Yang stumbled and fell to the ground with the momentum of his missed attack. He was in shock, unable to comprehend how Feng Hao could possess such strength despite being only at the third level of a martial apprentice. Feng Hao taunted Yang, advising him to focus more on practicing his military skills rather than engaging in verbal confrontations. Onlookers marveled at the sight, considering it an eye-opener to witness a third-level martial apprentice suppressing a fourth-level one. Rumors spread that Yang Kui had advanced to the fourth level through pills and elixirs, further fueling his anger. He yelled at his group members to attack Feng Hao, seeking revenge. However, before Yang's group could carry out the attack, they heard a familiar voice. Feng Hao's father, Feng Chun, had arrived on the scene. Feng Chun ridiculed Yang for calling for help in a martial arts competition and held a pot in his hand, declaring that he would handle the situation himself. Yang realized his impulsive actions and informed Feng Chun that he would participate in the bloodline test of the four clans in half a month and intended to confront Feng Hao there. He vowed to repay twice the shame that Feng Hao gave him. Feng Hao remained unfazed by Yang's threats, seemingly undeterred by the challenge. Meanwhile, Yang ordered his pharmacist to prepare the best pills for him, intending to use them to defeat Feng Hao in front of the entire city during the upcoming test. With a smile, Feng Hao asked his father if he witnessed the confrontation. Feng Chen chuckled and confirmed that he was watching, expressing his confidence in Feng Hao. Feng Hao responded affirmatively, feeling reassured by his father's belief in him. Later, Feng Hao sat beside a table with energy emanating from it and called out to Lao Lao. In a half-asleep state, Lao Lao asked why Feng Hao was disturbing her sleep in the middle of the night. Feng Hao informed her that he had gathered all the ingredients needed for the martial pill and sought guidance on the refinement process. Lao Lao dismissed the complexity of making a pill, pointing out that Feng Hao had the pharmacopoeia in his body and should consume it. Confused about directly eating the pharmacopoeia, Feng Hao sought clarification. He attempted to clarify his confusion by asking again if he should eat the ingredients raw, but has yet to receive a response from Lao Lao. He took a deep breath and consumed the ingredients raw, but the taste was terrible. After finishing them, Feng Hao wondered what to do next, and turned to consult the pharmacopoeia inside his mind. Closing his eyes, Feng Hao saw green energy emanating from one of the writings in the pharmacopoeia. There was a hole in the writing through which the green energy flowed. The power jumped onto him as he approached the green spot, and his body absorbed it. He felt great, filled with energy, and noticed his strength had improved. Under the scorching sun, Feng Hao practiced martial arts in the forest, sweating profusely. He realized that he could recover his power in just a few minutes, which previously would have taken half a day. Meditating with his eyes closed, he marveled at the convenience of storing and concocting pills inside his body. Opening his eyes, a whoosh of energy inside him revitalized him. However, Feng Hao recognized the problem of the limited supply of medicinal ingredients. The small amount he could afford with half a year's savings had been used up in a day. He pondered what to do next and devised an idea, deciding to seek out Master Lao Lao. With a poof, Lao Lao appeared before him and asked Feng Hao to share his experience with the divine pharmacopoeia and its effects on him. Feng Hao praised Lao for the incredible excellent knowledge she had imparted to him, likening it to an endless sea of treasures. Flattered by the compliments, Lao Lao asked what Feng Hao wanted from her now, but she quickly clarified that she had no pills to offer. Feng Hao then mentioned the possibility of exchanging some of Lao Lao's lower-level manuals, which were used only for boiling tea, in exchange for medicinal ingredients. However, Lao Lao playfully teased Feng Hao, suggesting he was also eyeing her manuals. Despite this, she threw three manuals at him, including the black-grade swirling sand palm, earthquake fist, and cloud-step low-rank techniques. Feng Hao was astonished to see such valuable items, aware of the commotion these manuals could cause in the city. Feng Hao arrived at the auction house with his mask and an oversized cape, recalling visiting this place with his father. He believed it was the only place where he could sell high-grade items. He approached the front desk inside the auction house, where a lady asked if she could assist him. Feng Hao revealed his intention to auction something, and when asked what it was, he whipped out the black-grade technique manual. The girl at the front desk was shocked to see a black-grade technique being presented for auction. The news spread among the people present at the auction house causing a stir of excitement and curiosity. With this news of such a treasure appearing at the auction house, people started running to notify their clans. The girl at the front desk apologized for freaking out, 
and Feng Hao reassured her that it was okay. She then invited him into a room for further discussion. As Feng Hao waited in the room, a man named Uyan Peng descended the stairs, laughing. Peng introduced himself and apologized for not greeting Feng Hao earlier. He realized that Feng Hao could afford to auction a black grade technique, and believed being on good terms with someone of such high stature was essential. Peng inquired if Feng Hao wanted to auction the black grade approach, and Feng Hao confirmed this. Peng assured him that the Yajie Auction House would auction it for a satisfactory price. He proposed advertising the item for three days before putting it up for auction, and asked for Feng Hao's opinion. Wearing the crow mask, Feng Hao agreed to the plan but clarified that he wasn't seeking money. Peng was shocked by this revelation, wondering what could be worth similar to Feng Hao if not money. When Peng asked what he desired, Feng Hao replied that he wanted medicinal ingredients. Peng couldn't believe it. He realized that this person selling the black grade technique could trade it for medicinal ingredients worth all the cities combined, indicating that Feng Hao might be one of those legendary pharmacists. Filled with awe and respect, Peng showed respect before Feng Hao, apologizing for not recognizing him as an esteemed pharmacist. Feng Hao reassured Peng that he still had many matters for which he would seek Peng's assistance. He extended a hand to help Peng, appreciating Peng's business acumen and realizing that he needed to be cautious with his words. Peng promptly called someone and ordered them to bring every single ledger to the pharmacy. He then presented a book to Feng Hao, asking him to examine it and see if it would be helpful. Peng suggested that Feng Hao could take it as their deposit for the manuscript of the black grade technique. Feng Hao agreed to the arrangement, handing over the black grade manual to Peng, who was amazed at how easily Feng Hao had given it to him. Meanwhile, Feng Hao opened the book and realized that the quality and quantity of all the medicinal ingredients listed needed to be higher for his needs. He understood that the requirements of the divine pharmacopoeia were too high for what Peng's small pharmacy could provide. Feng Hao expressed his concern to Peng, stating that the amount of medicinal ingredients was insufficient. In response, Peng assured him to trust the capabilities of the Ya Jie Auction House. Peng proposed that Feng Hao write down the required medicinal ingredients, promising to satisfy them. Feng Hao handed back the ledger after writing down his requirements, explaining to Peng that the listed ingredients would do for now, but he omitted the rarer ones for the time being. Peng was baffled by the extensive list of over 500 different types of medicinal ingredients. He realized that Feng Hao must be an earth-grade pharmacist, a rarity on the continent. Undeterred by the cost, Peng immediately prepared all the ingredients for Feng Hao, determined to win his favor, even if it meant going bankrupt. As the clock rang, Feng Hao waited for Peng to return with the prepared ingredients. When Peng arrived, he presented a ring containing all the medicinal ingredients, offering it as a greeting gift from the Yajie Auction House. Feng Hao recognized the ring's value and estimated it must have cost Peng at least 10,000 gold pieces. He was astonished that Peng was giving it to him for free. Feng Hao accepted the ring, thanking Peng sincerely. He acknowledged his unfamiliarity with the market of medicinal ingredients and promised to compensate Peng if he had taken too many. Peng assured him there was no need for compensation and invited Feng Hao to attend the auction in three days. Feng Hao agreed but mentioned that his attendance would depend on his availability. As he left, he assured Peng that he would come if he had the time. Feng Hao continued to practice martial arts, pushing himself to the limit. He utilized the medicinal ingredients he obtained from Peng to recover his stamina quickly, allowing him to train without any breaks. Feng Hao could feel his abilities rapidly improving due to his dedication. During his training, he noticed that an image of a tiger frequently appeared in his mind. Determined to explore this further, Feng Hao confronted the image head-on. With a deep breath, he unleashed his energy and focused on bringing out the tiger's essence. As he immersed himself in the technique, a vivid manifestation of the tiger emerged. The tiger roared ferociously, and Feng Hao attempted to engage with it using his martial arts. However, the encounter was intense, and the tiger's power overwhelmed him, suddenly causing the vision to disappear. Confused and frightened, Feng Hao turned to Lao Lao for answers. Lao Lao chuckled, and revealed that the idea was a black grade technique from the Tiger Step scroll called Azure Tiger Dash. Feng Hao's excitement grew upon realizing he had experienced a Zhuan grade martial approach. He was eager to learn it. Yet in his excitement, Feng Hao jumped and hurt his back. He fell to the ground in pain, seeking Lao Lao's help. Lao Lao warned him to treat the injury quickly, as neglecting it could lead to severe consequences. Feng Hao meditated on this, sensing that Lao Lao seemed troubled about something. Curious, he asked Lao Lao what was bothering her. Lao Lao responded that she was still determining whether to praise or scold Feng Hao. She admired his sharp understanding, but couldn't overlook his weak physique. Lao Lao explained that the Tiger Dash chapter, though meant for refining the body, actually contained advanced tiger movement martial arts, suitable only for individuals with a certain level of physical prowess. She warned Feng Hao that attempting such moves without a well-trained body might lead to harm. Acknowledging the dilemma of being a gifted individual, Feng Hao eagerly suggested starting their practice immediately. He had gathered some medicinal herbs that would sustain him for a while. Encouraged by Feng Hao's enthusiasm, Lao Lao believed he might genuinely be able to assist her. Two days later, the students of the Feng family gathered, discussing a new Exuan grade technique that had appeared in the city. They shared rumors about how prominent families had diligently prepared to find it, with people coming from other places, wondering if the Feng family had any chance of obtaining it. One of the students, 
Feng Lei mentioned his father's assurance that this technique would benefit the family. Feng Lei said he would also teach other students when he learned the method. After discussing the black raid approach, the students began asking each other about Feng Hao's whereabouts. Little did they know that Feng Hao was standing nearby, overhearing their conversation. He decided to address them, suggesting they spend their time training instead of gossiping. However, one of the students retorted, claiming that Feng Hao still acted as if he were the son of the patriarch and implied that he should stay away as long as Feng Lei competed. Feng Lei intervened, defending Feng Hao as a family member, and promised to teach him the Xuan grade technique if the Feng family won it in the auction. Upon hearing this, Feng Hao was surprised to learn that the Feng family was also participating in the auction, and he decided to investigate. He exited, stating that he didn't need the technique, pretending that his stomach was hurting as an excuse for leaving. Feng Lei and his friends belittled Feng Hao, noting that he was only at the fourth rank, and declaring that Feng Lei wouldn't allow him to continue. Meanwhile, a worker informed Peng that the auction was nearing its end at the auction house and advised him to attend to the guests. However, Peng brushed off the worker, expressing that he was waiting for an immortal and believed the person was worth sacrificing his life for. Suddenly, Feng Hao, dressed in a masked cloak again, arrived at the auction and apologized to Peng for the delay. Peng, now attentive, welcomed him, and they both appeared on the auction stage. The crowd was abuzz, wondering about the mysterious cloaked figure and what he had to offer to Yulan City. Feeling a bit self-conscious under the gaze of so many people, Feng Hao became shy. Peng took the stage and apologized for the wait, declaring that he would personally auction off the final item. Flourishing, he unveiled the black grade technique known as the Dazzling Sand Palm. Peng didn't delve into the specifics, assuming all the guests were martial arts experts who knew more about it than he did. He initiated the bidding at 50,000 gold coins, with increments of no less than a thousand. Suddenly, a man rose and confidently bid 100,000, stating that he saw it as a rare opportunity. The onlookers were amazed by the substantial bid made by the Wan family. Not long after, another person countered with 150,000. Some hesitated to bid higher, fearing to offend the Wan family, but the allure of the high-grade technique proved too tempting to resist. Another voice joined the bidding, offering 180,000. The bidder knew it would exhaust their budget for the next few years, but they believed it could significantly impact their clan's fortunes. People in the crowd began to talk, noting that while the Feng family called the money that way, it seemed apparent that the Feng family wasn't as wealthy as others. A guest among the participants decided it was time to make a move, and attempted to bid 200,000, but before he could speak, someone from behind him called out 300,000. It was the Wan family. Wan, feeling confident, thought about how the other families couldn't compete against two powerful families. The Yun family had already provided him with sufficient funds, and he believed Yulan City would ultimately belong to his family. Peng, the auctioneer, declared 300,000 once, 300,000 twice, and then sold the technique. The crowd was excited, realizing that this acquisition could change the landscape of Yulan City, and some considered joining the Wan family. However, just as everyone was about to leave, a voice urged the Feng family to wait. All eyes turned to see a cloaked and masked figure. Feng Hao had arrived. The Feng family believed this mysterious individual might intend to befriend them, so their leader took the initiative. As the leader began to speak, Feng Hao turned toward Feng Chen and confidently identified him by name, stating he must be Feng Chen. Feng Hao then asks Feng Chen how much money he has. Feng Chen replied that he had 200,000 gold coins on hand. With a mischievous smile, Feng Hao mentioned that he was short of 200,000 and proposed a deal with Feng Chen. He presented the earthquake fist and cloud moving block techniques to Feng Chen as a trade. The onlookers were astonished, believing the mysterious man must have some strong connection to the Feng family. However, Wan perceived it as an attempt to humiliate him and felt uneasy. Feng Chen was shocked by the unexpected gift, but reassured Feng Hao that he didn't find the price too high. In fact, he felt flattered by the gesture. Feng Hao declared the deal settled, and Feng Chen expressed his gratitude. Other families witnessing this turn of events felt disheartened, realizing their prospects in Yulan City were now grim, and they might face expulsion. As night fell, the Feng elders gathered to examine the newly acquired techniques. Curious about the mysterious man who gave Feng Chen the methods, they asked him if he knew the person. Feng Chen denied any knowledge of him. The Feng elders speculated that this mysterious benefactor could be a friend of their ancestors, guiding Feng Hao in the process. They considered the possibility that this enigmatic figure was influencing Feng Hao. As the other Feng family members discussed amongst themselves, they realized why Feng Hao's cultivation, which had been stagnant for a long time, had suddenly experienced a breakthrough. However, they acknowledged that even with this progress, Feng Hao was still only at rank 3, making him ineligible for the Four Clans competition. Elder Feng held the technique in his hand and proposed to Feng Lei that they arrange for Feng Hao to participate in the competition, while Feng Lei would continue training for a bit longer. Feng Lei's father objected, asserting that as the head of the family, his son should represent the Feng family in the competition. Elder Feng, unwavering, declared that he had already made the decision, and abruptly ended the meeting, leaving Feng Lei's father dissatisfied. As the other Feng elders departed, the eldest Feng called Feng Chen to stay behind. In a dimly lit room, 
the eldest Feng spoke to Feng Chen, expressing his belief that Feng Chen was the most suitable candidate in his generation to lead the Feng clan. He criticized Feng Lei for being too impulsive. Despite recognizing Feng Hao's potential, the eldest Feng stated that he had to change the leader for the family's sake. Feng Chen humbly accepted the responsibility, understanding the importance of his role in the clan's future. The eldest Feng praised Feng Hao's diligence and hard work, foreseeing him becoming a strong man. Placing his hand on Feng Chen's shoulder, the eldest Feng emphasized that Feng Chen was the last hope for the Feng clan, and that the clan's future could not fall into the wrong hands. As the eldest Feng departed, he reminded Feng Chen to train Feng Hao well. As the night fell, Feng Hao continued his rigorous training, marveling at his rapid progress, having already broken through to the fourth rank of martial apprentice. Suddenly, he heard someone congratulating him from behind, and when he turned around, he saw that it was his father, Feng Chen. Feng Chen praised Feng Hao for reaching the fourth rank, and inquired if the person who taught him this method was a black-robed man. Feng Hao seemed puzzled, and asked how his father knew about it. Feng Chen replied that Feng Hao couldn't keep such things hidden from him, and he reassured Feng Hao not to let that man down. He revealed that there would be a competition among the four clans, and Feng Hao had been selected to participate in it. Excited and happy about the opportunity, Feng Hao playfully joked about how mad Feng Lei must be right now, and how he probably couldn't sleep. Feng Chen joined in the joke, reminding Feng Hao not to disgrace the Feng clan, to which Feng Hao confidently replied that he wouldn't let them down. The day of the four clans competition arrived, and a crowd gathered around the stage excitedly. People discussed their favorites and placed bets on the competitors. Just as the announcement was about to begin, Yang stepped forward and leaped onto the stage, surprising everyone. People admired Yang's calm demeanor, but were confused about why he was taking the stage at that moment. Yang impatiently declared that he wanted to start, interrupting the scheduled announcement. Yang was surprised to see Feng Hao approaching the stage despite his warning. The crowd was shocked and murmured about the potential danger Feng Hao was putting himself in. Yang taunted Feng Hao, warning him not to even think about approaching. But Feng Hao remained undeterred, confidently walking onto the stage. The spectators couldn't believe what they were witnessing, fearing that Feng Hao was walking into a death sentence. Yang confronted Feng Hao, threatening to make him pay in blood for their previous encounter. He boasted about showing Feng Hao the vast difference in their strengths at the fourth rank. Yang even expressed his intention to cripple Feng Hao, so Wan Xin would give up on him. Yang launched a martial arts strike at Feng Hao with great speed, expecting it to hit him without fail. However, to Yang's surprise, Feng Hao effortlessly tilted his head and dodged the attack. Feng Hao appeared calm and collected, leaving Yang bewildered as he couldn't comprehend how Feng Hao had improved so significantly. Yang wasn't ready to give up, so he followed up with a powerful punch, fully believing it would land. However, Feng Hao greeted the point with a smile, effortlessly blocking it using his foot while gracefully jumping in the process. Feng Hao skillfully stopped Yang's forces and even leaped off one to evade it swiftly. The crowd marveled at the apparent change in Feng Hao's strength, wondering how he had become so powerful. As Yang attempted to strike again, Feng Hao effortlessly dodged his attacks, provoking Yang's anger. Yang shouted at Feng Hao, urging him to stand his ground and fight face to face. Observing Feng Hao's impressive movements, the spectators believed he might have broken through to a higher cultivation level. However, Feng Hao remained composed and calmly encouraged Yang to give his best shot. In response, Yang gathered his energy and unleashed a powerful finger attack, vehemently declaring that Feng Hao was doomed. Undeterred, Feng Hao charged forward at incredible speed, causing Yang to halt his attack and brace himself for a dodge. However, to Yang's surprise, Feng Hao quickly circled to strike from behind, leaving him unable to evade the attack. Realizing he couldn't escape, Yang braced himself for the impending blow. Feng Hao's fist connected with Yang's back with tremendous force, causing a resounding boom. The Yang family watched in shock as they screamed for Yang's well-being. Meanwhile, Feng Hao reassured everyone that Yang had merely fainted from the shock as the announcement declared Feng Hao the round winner. The crowd cheered and applauded, appreciating his impressive martial arts skills. Speculations arose about the next challenger, whether it would be the Wan family or someone else. Suddenly, Hu Ku from the Hu clan stepped forward to challenge Feng Hao, acknowledging his remarkable martial prowess. The crowd whispered about Hu Ku and Yang Kui being martial apprentices at the middle stage fourth rank, speculating that Feng Hao had possibly reached the late stage fourth rank. Hu Ku exuded confidence and revealed a secret item, a yellow ball, which he consumed. With a smirk, he admitted that defeating Feng Hao at the peak of the fourth rank might prove difficult. However, Hu Ku announced his readiness to showcase his terrifying combat power at the fifth rank. His intentions were clear. The Hu clan aimed to take charge of Yulan City. At the fifth level, Hu Ku tore his clothes off, revealing his muscular physique, and boldly challenged Feng Hao. This surprising sight left the Feng clan members both shocked and puzzled. They wondered how someone could advance so quickly. The leader of the Feng clan explained that this wasn't precisely an advancement, but rather a method of suppressing one's rank. He compared the process of cultivation to filling a bag with water. Most people absorbed martial energy from the world around them until their water bag was complete, 
allowing them to break through to the next level. However, he clarified that absorbing martial energy became tougher as one progressed to higher levels. He went on to describe the unique approach of the Hu family. Instead of breaking through at lower levels, they accumulated energy intensely, waiting for the right moment to advance all at once. This strategy kept them at a lower level while maintaining considerable power. Feng Lei, a member of the Feng clan, inquired about Hu Ku's current status. The Feng clan leader expressed concern that Hu Ku's level was probably approaching the middle fifth rank. With an overwhelming surge of power, Hu Ku boldly challenged Feng Hao, inviting him to fight and promising to reveal the true might of the Hu family. Hu Ku asserted that even if Feng Hao doubted their strength, he was about to witness something astonishing. Taking the initiative, Hu Ku advanced toward Feng Hao, determined to prove his point. As Hu Ku moved forward, he declared that if Feng Hao didn't take the first step, he would do it instead. Hu Ku lunged at Feng Hao with remarkable speed, catching him off guard. Feng Hao was taken aback not only by Hu Ku's swiftness, but also by the immense destruction his movements caused in their surroundings. Hu Ku pressed on, launching an attack and leaping onto Feng Hao, asserting he still needed to finish. He loaded his punch, vowing to let Feng Hao flee from him. In response, Feng Hao used his hand to block Hu Ku's punch, contemplating whether he could match a middle fifth rank opponent. While Feng Hao managed to stop the attack, the sheer force of Hu Ku's strike pushed him backward. Trembling, Feng Hao realized that if it weren't for his healing abilities, that blow could have defeated him. As he shook with uncertainty, Feng Hao acknowledged that he seemed no match for Hu Ku, feeling overwhelmed and powerless. Amongst the crowd, discussions buzzed about Feng Hao's valiant effort. He had reached the peak of the fourth rank, yet it seemed he couldn't withstand the might of the fifth rank. Someone remarked that they never anticipated the first among the new generation to attain the fifth rank from the Hu family. Meanwhile, Feng Chun's concern for Feng Hao grew. He believed that Feng Hao couldn't defeat Hu Ku directly and that surrender might be the best option. On the other hand, Hu Ku grew increasingly confident and boastful. He questioned what had happened to Feng Hao's earlier toughness, taunting him to continue and claiming he was just getting started. Hu Ku leaped into action with his confidence soaring toward Feng Hao. He lunged from the air, launching a fist attack at Feng Hao. Feng Hao managed to evade the attack narrowly, but doubt clouded his thoughts. He questioned his ability to contend with Hu Ku's strength, feeling outmatched and uncertain. As Hu Ku continued his assault with unrestrained power, he urged Feng Hao to surrender, asserting that it would lead to less suffering and save time. Amidst the turmoil, Feng Hao's mind swirled with memories of being labeled a failure for years. He contemplated surrendering, accepting defeat. However, Hu Ku's anger grew as Feng Hao remained defiant. Hu Ku declared his intention to unleash an all-out attack that could leave Feng Hao severely injured or worse. Meanwhile, Feng Hao battled a fierce internal struggle. He struggled with the idea of giving up and the potential mockery that could result. Yet his determination grew more robust, and he clenched his fist in resolve. As Hu Ku prepared to strike with all his might, he taunted that his attack would reduce Feng Hao to a complete failure. Suddenly, Feng Hao's eyes snapped open, and he countered Hu Ku's assault with an attack of his own. The clash of their spells resulted in a massive burst of energy, the intensity of which shot high into the sky. Both combatants landed on opposite sides, and their confrontation momentarily halted. In a seated position, Feng Hao declared his name, ready to continue the fight. However, the crowd's voice surged, interrupting his declaration. They claimed that Feng Hao had fallen, and victory belonged to the Hu clan. On the opposite side, Hu Ku chuckled, acknowledging Feng Hao's unexpected resilience. However, just as he claimed victory, he was overcome by sudden coughing, followed by a burst of energy that immobilized him in place. The crowd grew concerned, shouting at Hu Ku to rise. Meanwhile, Feng Hao finished his statement asserting he was no longer a failure. With a triumphant shout, Feng Hao questioned who else wished to challenge him. He declared himself Feng Hao from the Feng family, ready to face any opponent until the end. Then, the announcements revealed the round's victor, Feng Hao. Hu Ku remained motionless on the stage, while Feng Hao stood on the opposite side. The spectators witnessed this astonishing turn of events with amazement and disbelief. They exchanged comments about the unexpected outcome, questioning how Hu Ku, who was in the middle rank of the fighting stage, had fallen. Speculations arose, with someone pondering if Feng Hao might have reached the fifth stage of the martial apprentice rank, which would explain his unexpected victory over Hu Ku. Meanwhile, Feng Hao stood with his head lowered, reflecting on the close call he had just experienced. He realized that without the pharmacopoeia, the outcome could have been dire. In a flashback, he recalled the intense moment when Hu Ku had launched an attack, pouncing on him aggressively. In response, Feng Hao devised a strategy. He recognized that he needed to relinquish his defensive stance and channel his energy into a powerful offensive strike to secure victory. He decided to utilize the pharmacopoeia's healing properties in advance to ensure his survival. Simultaneously, his right hand amassed strength for a final decisive blow. Employing the Tiger Dash spell, Feng Hao focused his energy on his fist, aiming to shed his failure label and claim victory. As Hu Ku's attack neared, Feng Hao unleashed his own Tiger Dash-empowered strike with all his might. The collision erupted with a resounding boom, signaling Feng Hao's triumph. In the aftermath of the clash, 
Feng Hao sensed a transformation within his body, a surge of heightened energy that coursed through him. He could feel the energy's dynamic movement, a sensation that was now intertwined with his physical being. This intense burst of energy granted him the power to continue fighting and facilitated his breakthrough to the fifth rank. The revelation of Feng Hao's breakthrough to the fifth rank astonished everyone. The announcer Peng admired the remarkable feat and deemed it wonderful and brilliant. He declared Feng Hao and the Feng family winners of the second round. The crowd cheered, congratulating Feng Hao and enthusiastically chanting his name. Peng then inquired about the Wan family's contender for the third round. A Wan family elder apologized for not having a new fifth stage martial apprentice among their ranks. He congratulated the Feng family for their victory in the competition. Ping officially announced Feng Hao's victory, leading the crowd into an enthusiastic celebration. They marveled at how Feng Hao, once labeled a family waste, had turned the tables, showcasing his genius. Amid the jubilation, Feng Hao, having fought valiantly and achieved his breakthrough, was visibly shaking and eventually fainted on the stage. His father, Feng Chen, caught him as he began to fall, expressing his pride in Feng Hao's accomplishment. In a half-fainted state, Feng Hao conveyed that he would never let his father down. As night fell at the Yang Mansion, the leader of the Yang family gathered everyone to discuss the current state of affairs in Yulan City. He acknowledged that they were likely aware of the ongoing situation. Specifically, he mentioned that Wan Xin of the Wan family possessed a rare attribute in martial arts, hinting at a promising future for her. Moreover, he emphasized that the Feng family had obtained two advanced secret martial arts techniques, making them formidable competitors in the new generation. Curious about their opinions, the Yang leader turned to the other elders. One elder cautioned against offending the Wan family, which enjoyed protection from the powerful Yun family. This made it clear that the smaller families needed help to challenge them. Another elder highlighted the close ties between the Feng family and a mysterious individual. He advised against hasty actions, given the sensitive nature of the situation. Amidst the discussion, a young father in the Yang family expressed frustration, unable to bear the sight of his injured son lying in a hospital bed. Another member of the Yang family suggested that they shouldn't directly target the Feng family, but instead focus on eliminating Feng Hao. This approach, they believed, would safeguard their interests. Upon hearing this, the young father muttered Feng Hao's name twice, showing his concern and potentially harboring danger. In the quiet forest, Feng Hao was meditating when he detected a subtle presence passing by. Alert and focused, he heard a voice responding to his quick reaction. Familiarizing himself with the agent, Feng Hao was suddenly attacked by the person behind the voice. Adorned with a cloak, this masked individual swiftly grabbed Feng Hao's neck. Looking up at the masked figure, Feng Hao engaged in a tense exchange. The masked man explained that he was merely carrying out a duty. Someone had paid for Feng Hao's life. Feng Hao enacted a spell on the masked man's leg as the conversation unfolded. Sensing an unusual sensation in his leg, the masked person began comprehending the danger. Before he could fully grasp the situation, Feng Hao employed a burst of energy, resulting in a powerful explosion. In an instant, Feng Hao disappeared, leaving behind a trail of smoke. Confused, the masked man pondered where Feng Hao had vanished. To himself he marveled at Feng Hao's exceptional martial skills that enabled him to fight even in such dire circumstances. Despite his admiration, the masked man recognized the threat Feng Hao posed. He resolved that the more such incidents occurred, the less likely he would spare Feng Hao's life. The masked man embarked on a search throughout the forest, determined to locate Feng Hao. He taunted that if Feng Hao dared to reveal himself, he would make the process of ending his life much easier. Amid the forest's concealment, Feng Hao took cover behind a tree, recognizing that the masked man before him was a formidable opponent. He assessed that his chances of using the pharmacopoeia were running thin. Remaining hidden, Feng Hao contemplated his options. He realized that venturing farther would risk revealing his position. He decided to call out to Lao Lao for assistance, but the expected response didn't come. Acknowledging that he had to rely on himself, Feng Hao felt his injured arm nearing full recovery. Meanwhile, the masked man continued his search, believing that Feng Hao must lurk nearby. Suddenly, he heard a crackling sound. Convinced he had pinpointed Feng Hao's location, with a triumphant laugh, the masked man leaped toward the tree that emitted the noise. However, upon closer inspection, he only found Feng Hao's shirt draped over sticks. The masked man realized he had been outsmarted, and his annoyance grew. As his attention was drawn to the shirt, the masked man suddenly sensed a powerful force above him. He looked up to witness a swirling mass of energy clouds looming overhead. In a sudden turn of events, Feng Hao emerged from the swirling energy clouds, launching a ferocious attack on the masked man with the power-packed Azure Tiger Palm. His determination was evident as he put his entire force into the strike, pushing the limits of his own body. Amidst the impact, a deafening boom echoed through the forest, illuminating the surroundings with a brilliant burst of light. Smoke billowed from the point of collision, creating an intense cloud of haze. The masked man, who had taken refuge behind a tree, chuckled and praised the peerless nature of the current generation's fighters. 
However, his appearance was now altered, with half of his face mask destroyed, and his face partially exposed. He admitted that resisting Feng Hao's attack had taken a toll on him, severely injuring him. With a sly smirk revealed through the torn mask, he lamented that Feng Hao's body couldn't quite withstand the tremendous force of the blow. In his view, this meant that the masked man still held the upper hand. Amid the forest's concealment, Feng Hao took cover behind a tree, recognizing that the masked man before him was a formidable opponent. He assessed that his chances of using the pharmacopoeia were running thin. Remaining hidden, Feng Hao contemplated his options. He realized that venturing farther would risk revealing his position. He decided to call out to Lao Lao for assistance, but the expected response didn't come. Acknowledging that he had to rely on himself, Feng Hao felt his injured arm nearing full recovery. Meanwhile, the masked man continued his search believing that Feng Hao must lurk nearby. Suddenly, he heard a crackling sound, convinced he had pinpointed Feng Hao's location. With a triumphant laugh, the masked man leaped toward the tree that emitted the noise. However, upon closer inspection, he only found Feng Hao's shirt draped over sticks. The masked man realized he had been outsmarted, and his annoyance grew. As his attention was drawn to the shirt, the masked man suddenly sensed a powerful force above him. He looked up to witness a swirling mass of energy clouds looming overhead. In a sudden turn of events, Feng Hao emerged from the swirling energy clouds, launching a ferocious attack on the masked man with the power-packed Azure Tiger Palm. His determination was evident as he put his entire force into the strike, pushing the limits of his own body. Amidst the impact, a deafening boom echoed through the forest, illuminating the surroundings with a brilliant burst of light. Smoke billowed from the point of collision, creating an intense cloud of haze. The masked man, who had taken refuge behind a tree, chuckled and praised the peerless nature of the current generation's fighters. However, his appearance was now altered, with half of his face mask destroyed and his face partially exposed, and perplexed the masked man, who believed that even in his best condition, he wouldn't dare venture into that dangerous territory alone. He regarded Feng Hao's decision as audacious and somewhat irrational, considering the perils that awaited him. With a resigned attitude, the masked man determined that there was little need to pursue Feng Hao further. He planned to return and report the situation, convinced that Feng Hao was as good as dead, especially if he continued towards the perilous mountain. Suddenly, a powerful impact rocked the masked man as he was struck by someone else, Hu, who had dispatched the masked man to eliminate Feng Hao. The Hu leader scolded the masked man, berating his inability to handle a single martial apprentice and deeming him worthless. The leader then ordered their forces to take action. He instructed them to seal off all exits of the Demon Beast Mountain, ensuring that Feng Hao either perished within or met his end upon exiting. Amid the jungle, Feng Hao pressed forward, his progress sluggish and deliberate. Despite his exhaustion, he persevered, driven by the thought that he couldn't falter or succumb to death just yet. However, the strain proved too much, and Feng Hao eventually collapsed to the ground. In his weakened state, he reminded himself that he mustn't give in to the circumstances. A pair of menacing beasts emerged as he lay on the ground, their growls resonating in the air. Lying face down on the basis, Feng Hao began emitting a surge of energy that pulsed outwards in all directions. The powerful pulses resonated through the surroundings, causing all nearby beasts to retreat in response. Amid this intense energy display, Lao Lao emerged, her concern evident. She acknowledged that her intervention could have been better, but she was willing to assist Feng Hao this one time. As the morning sun illuminated the landscape, Feng Hao gradually stirred awake. Rising to his feet, he stretched as if awakening from a night's sleep. Baffled by his surroundings, he questioned why he was lying there and wondered who had come to his rescue. His gaze fell upon a tree emitting a soft light, and he immediately recognized it as the presence of Lao Lao. Addressing the possibility, he cautiously inquired if it was indeed Little Master Lao Lao. In response, Lao Lao confirmed her involvement, explaining that her intervention had prevented Feng Hao from becoming the meal of a demon beast. Expressing his gratitude, Feng Hao queried if she knew a way back to safety. Lao Lao's suggestion caught him off guard. She advised him not to return and survive alone. This notion left Feng Hao surprised and concerned, asserting that even a skilled martial practitioner might struggle to survive in this harsh environment. Determined, Feng Hao bid farewell to Lao Lao and started leaving the forest. However, his steps halted as Lao Lao's voice reached his ears. She posed a poignant question. Did he want to bear the label of a loser for the rest of his life? Lao Lao continued motivating Feng Hao, stressing that true martial strength is only cultivated when facing life and death situations or external pressures. She emphasized that relying solely on his current warlike state would not suffice and could lead to his demise. Pointing out that he was only a military apprentice, she questioned how he could stand against Yun Ying, who was already a martial spirit. Lao Lao reminded Feng Hao of his responsibility to protect the Feng family. Inspired by her words, Feng Hao acknowledged that Lao was right. He resolved to conquer the Demon Beast Mountain and become a formidable martial artist. This declaration brought a sense of satisfaction to Lao Lao. At Feng's mansion, a voice exclaimed in disbelief. The masked assassin who had targeted Feng Hao now stood before the Feng family, recounting his ordeal of being beaten by the Hu and Yang families. Feng Chen, upon learning of the assault on Feng Hao, was furious. He vehemently condemned the audacity of these families to harm his son. The Feng family rallied together, preparing to confront the Hu and Yang families. 
Feng Lie and other elite members of the Feng family were summoned, ready to face these rival families and bring them to justice. During the cover of the night, an attack was initiated at the Hu residence, setting the stage for a tense confrontation. Feng Chen and the other elite Feng members confronted Hu and Yang at the Hu residence. Hu emerged and expressed disbelief at Feng Li and Feng Chen's audacity. In intense fury, Feng Chen berated them as dogs and dismissed any need to explain himself. Without hesitation, Feng Chun initiated an attack, his anger propelling his actions as he aimed to vanquish his rivals. Using a whip, Feng Chun cast a spell and raised his arm, summoning a powerful wind strike toward Hu. In a vehement outcry, he declared that everyone would face the consequences. Hu and Yang, caught off guard, braced themselves for the impending assault, loading up their energy in preparation for their counterattacks. As the tension escalated, Hu and Yang unleashed their spells in tandem, resulting in a colossal explosion that momentarily blinded and startled the nearby Feng members. The resulting impact produced a resounding boom that soared into the skies, creating billowing smoke clouds as the spells collided. After defending against the onslaught, Feng Chun reflected on the formidable strength of the two patriarchs from the Hu and Yang families. Meanwhile, Hu and Yang, having launched the attack, realized that their assumption of Feng Chun's vulnerability had been misguided. Amidst the escalating clash between Feng's elite members and those of Hu and Yang, a commanding voice abruptly pierced the tension, ordering them to halt. Sensing the powerful presence that emanated from the speaker, Feng Li pondered who this newcomer was, and whether Yulan City still housed such formidable martial artists. The individual in question held a fan and asserted that his intervention was unnecessary. Yang Ru, the chief caretaker of the auction house, arrived. He expressed concern over the potential repercussions of their conflict, highlighting that it involved three influential families. The Feng family justified their actions by explaining that Hu and Yang had instigated the violence by targeting their people and forcing their son into the treacherous Demon Beast Mountain. He emphasized their quest for justice. Ouyang listened carefully, his fan gesturing contemplatively. He acknowledged Feng's grievances, but reminded them that reckless actions within Yulan City wouldn't be tolerated. He assured them that he would dispatch someone to aid in the search for Feng's son within the dangerous mountain. Feng Lei recognized Ouyang's intervention as a temporary resolution to the matter at hand. He conceded that the confrontation was diffused due to Ouyang's influence. Before departing, Feng Lei emphasized that Hu and Yang should avoid underestimating the Feng family's strength and resolve. As the Feng family left, Feng Chun gave a meaningful glance back warning them they should hope for his son's well-being. He cautioned that failure to ensure his son's safety would have dire consequences for Hu and Yang. In response, Hu experienced a surge of worry. Considering that Feng Chen was already aware of their involvement, he acknowledged that their actions might lead to ruthless repercussions. Besides a picturesque waterfall, Feng Hao sat in contemplation, determined to clear his mind of distractions. He resolved to engage every muscle, feeling the cascade's refreshing water falling upon him. Amid the soothing sounds, he aimed to refine his movements, making them precise rather than arbitrary. Feng Hao focused on training a spell attack, mastering its initial form, and perfecting the engagement of his body, ultimately aiming for a flawless release. Observing his efforts, Lao Lao offered guidance. She advised Feng Hao to manage his energy usage to mitigate potential backlash when using the technique in the future. She emphasized that without experiencing life and death situations, realizing his full potential would prove challenging. Encouraging his growth, she suggested he begin hunting tier 6 demon beasts the following day. Feng Hao acknowledged her wisdom, still positioned beneath the waterfall. However, his astonishment was palpable when he comprehended the notion of facing a 6th tier beast. Sitting by the waterfall, Feng Hao voiced his concerns aloud, expressing his tier 5 status and yearning to return home. Suddenly, an unexpected attack targeted him from behind, prompting Feng Hao to evade the powerful spell swiftly. As he landed, he marveled at the attack's intensity, noting that it was just as potent as his capabilities. From the lingering smoke of the assault, aggressive roars echoed, signaling the presence of something formidable. Emerging from the haze, a ferocious fire beast appeared with a thunderous roar. Feng Hao observed the creature and acknowledged that provoking it directly would be unwise. The beast's power and expansive attack range made it a formidable opponent. Feng Hao quickly deduced that he needed to outsmart the creature. As the beast charged toward him, Feng Hao realized that despite its might, it was still just an animal. He resolved to showcase his strength and readiness to face it. Channeling his energy, he prepared to unleash his Azure Tiger Spirit. His strategy began with creating a smokescreen using the Tiger Palm attack, generating confusion to prevent the beast's retreat. With the smokescreen in place, Feng Hao continued his tactics by producing distinct sounds and launching an attack from an alternate direction. This strategy successfully bewildered the beast, highlighting its lack of intelligence. Amidst the confusion within the smoke clouds, Feng Hao exclaimed, Go! and sprinted toward the obscured area. Feng Hao's voice resounded as he declared that the moment had come to strike. With determination, he leaped forward, preparing a powerful punch to unleash upon the beast. 
Yet the creature swiftly dodged his attack and retaliated, catching Feng Hao off guard. Landing back on the ground, he felt confused and frustrated. He questioned how the beast had anticipated his move and why his diversionary tactic had failed. Observing the situation, Lao Lao said that roaring flame beasts possessed a sense of smell 30 times more acute than Feng Hao's. She pointed out that such minor tricks wouldn't deceive these creatures. Feng Hao wondered why Lao Lao hadn't informed him earlier, to which she calmly responded by redirecting his attention to the ongoing danger. Seeing the beast charging at him again, Feng Hao hastily gathered energy, determined to defeat it with a single powerful strike. Amidst his efforts, he pleaded with Lao Lao for assistance, expressing his urgency and impending danger. However, he noticed that she appeared peacefully asleep and seemingly unconcerned. Frustrated, Feng Hao implored Lao Lao to aid him, emphasizing that the beast was about to end his life. Lao Lao, half awake, calmly reminded him that she had already taught him the solution. Lao Lao chimed in, advising Feng Hao that there are better strategies than using the tiger palm against a fast opponent. Upon hearing this, Feng Hao had an epiphany. He had been approaching the situation incorrectly. He realized he should employ the speed-oriented version of the technique, the speed tiger palm. The beast's roars grew louder as it charged relentlessly toward Feng Hao. With newfound understanding, he focused on the only speed-based technique within the tiger-moving art. Gathering his energy, he unleashed the five-spirit tiger finger attack, resulting in a powerful explosion. The aftermath settled as the dust dispersed and the grass swayed in the wind. The beast lay lifeless on the ground, defeated. Examining his slightly bloodied fingers, Feng Hao felt happiness and relief. He realized the key was to enhance his speed and concentrate his power on a single point. Amidst the scene, the remains of bones fell to the ground. Seated amidst nature, Feng Hao chewed on a piece of the beast's meat, savoring its taste. He expressed his delight at how incredible the heart was and how it invigorated his entire body. Lao Lao noted that this was due to Feng Hao possessing pharmacopoeia, a unique ability that allowed him to harness such energy effortlessly. Feeling a sense of fortune, Feng Hao remarked that if he continued improving at this rate, a few more successful battles would allow him to quickly break through to the sixth tier of the Martial Apprentice. Lao Lao responded that employing reckless methods like before would only lead to Feng Hao's demise. Apologizing, Feng Hao continued enjoying his meal, his face smeared with meat juices. He resolved to think more strategically and employ tactics for his subsequent battles. As they sat there, Lao Lao's demeanor shifted, and she suddenly urged Feng Hao to stand and follow her. She excitedly shared that she had discovered something promising. Swiftly she soared into the sky, prompting Feng Hao, still holding two hefty pieces of meat, to request her to wait for him. Nearby, a tree rustled as a surge of energy passed by. Amidst their journey, Lao Lao inquired if Feng Hao had sensed anything yet. Slightly perplexed, he wondered if it was a demon beast approaching. Strangely, he couldn't feel anything nearby. Lao Lao explained that Feng Hao should be able to sense it from their current distance. She advised him to close his eyes and concentrate on perceiving it. Feng Hao acknowledged her guidance, and while continuing to run, he closed his eyes to focus his senses. As Feng Hao closed his eyes to concentrate, he sensed a surge of energy and saw an elixir in his mind's eye. Excitedly, he told Lao Lao that he had glimpsed a high-tier brew. Lao Lao responded with equal enthusiasm, mentioning that they had discovered a valuable treasure. Suddenly, Lao Lao shouted for him to halt, prompting Feng Hao to break and stop immediately. He pointed out that the elixir's location differed from what he had initially perceived. Agreeing, Feng Hao mentioned that it was right in front of them. Lao Lao's gaze settled on three spirit beasts, and she confirmed that three demon beasts were guarding the elixir. Feeling intimidated by the situation, Feng Hao admitted that he had been boasting earlier and felt too inexperienced to face the problem. He suggested they come back another time. However, Lao Lao explained that the Roaring Flame Beast, even though the lowest tier in that area, was still formidable. She added that the scent indicated the elixir was nearly fully formed. Lao Lao emphasized that missing the brew meant waiting for another century, to which Feng Hao replied that he understood. As he stretched himself, he declared he was ready to face the danger, as there were no rewards without confronting risks. As he started moving towards the beasts, Lao Lao intervened and told him to stop. She reminded him of their previous discussion, urging him to use his intelligence. Lao Lao assured him that the roaring flame beasts wouldn't leave their nest quickly, giving Feng Hao time to plan. As night fell, Feng Hao fashioned a shield from wood, strapping it to his left arm, and crafted a spear from another piece of wood, which he attached to his right arm. Seeing his preparations, Lao Lao questioned what he was getting ready for. Feng Hao expressed confidence in his crafting and combat skills, reassuring Lao Lao to wait and witness his performance. Under the high moonlight, Feng Hao got ready for his attack and reminded himself that these demon beasts had considerable intelligence, requiring caution for his plan to succeed. Holding his crafted spear in his right hand, he readied himself for action. He understood he couldn't let the beasts slip away and decided it was time to strike. With a determined leap, he lunged forward to attack, but the beasts sensed his movement and dodged his attack. After realizing their keen sense of smell made stealth difficult, Feng Hao changed his approach. He shifted to a direct attack strategy, took a stance, and spun his spear in his right hand. He confidently declared that he had observed the beast's attack patterns. One of the beasts, 
driven by rage, raised its arm to strike at Feng Hao. Meanwhile, Feng Hao watched for the right moment, and as the beast moved, he seized the opportunity to counterattack. Feng Hao struck the beast with his spear, causing it to roar in pain. He taunted the beast, mentioning how it felt to be hit by its own kind's bones. However, Feng Hao still needed to finish it. He tightened his left hand, preparing for another attack. With agility and power, he spun the spear and swiftly struck the beast. Blood splattered on Feng Hao as his strike hit home. Feeling confident, he pulled the spear from the now dead beast lying on the ground. Lao Lao advised Feng Hao not to be arrogant, as these beasts weren't foolish enough to be underestimated. Meanwhile, the other remaining beasts stepped forward. Feng Hao realized Lao Lao was right. These beasts wouldn't be easy to separate and fight one-on-one. -on -one. The two remaining beasts were furious and let out roars directed at Feng Hao. Suddenly, with a joint roar, both beasts launched an attack on Feng Hao simultaneously. Feng Hao's energy drained, and he realized the coordinated attacks were flawlessly executed. He was covered in scratches and bruises from these relentless assaults. Lao Lao observed this and warned Feng Hao that he was putting himself in danger of death. Feng Hao acknowledged her concern and explained that it was all part of his plan. He stepped back from the beasts, and they, sensing his retreat, moved closer. The beasts charged at Feng Hao with wild roars in a well-coordinated move. However, this time Feng Hao countered their attack. He strategized, deciding to take advantage of their pursuit. Feng Hao rushed forward, maneuvering between the two beasts and escaping their reach. The beasts, not wanting to lose their prey, followed in hot pursuit. As Feng Hao dashed through the forest, he spotted a rope hanging from a tree. Acting swiftly, he seized the rope and declared he'd demonstrate human intelligence. He pulled the cord, causing a reaction ahead. The pursuing beast suddenly halted, confronted by an unexpected obstacle approaching them. Suddenly, the ground erupted, and numerous wooden crafted spears burst forth. The beasts were taken aback as these spears formed a barrier, blocking their path toward Feng Hao. The pikes surrounded them on both sides, trapping them effectively. Still holding the rope, Feng Hao sat and observed the unfolding scene. He remarked that letting the beasts be arrogant allowed him to enjoy a satisfying spectacle. With a knife, Feng Hao cut the rope he held, triggering a release mechanism. Above the trees, something became free. The beasts, puzzled and intrigued, were left baffled by the situation and halted in confusion. Suddenly, a hefty log tied to rope swung down with tremendous force toward the beasts. Initially, the beasts failed to comprehend what was happening and remained frozen. They attempted to flee as they realized the impending danger, but it was too late. The swinging log came in full swing. As the swinging log collided with the beasts, Feng Hao declared that it was too late for them to escape and that he was about to reveal the flawlessness of his plan. He pointed to the ground, causing something to crack beneath the beasts. Amidst the cracking and booming noise, both beasts were drawn into the newly formed pit. Helpless and trapped, they found themselves in the cavity along with the wooden log. Approaching the hole, Feng Hao looked down at the captured beasts, now unable to escape. He taunted them, stating they were only subdued and would meet their end quietly. Frightened and shocked, the beasts huddled together, fearing their fate. The tranquil night sky was disturbed by a sudden voice and a surge of power, as Feng Hao exclaimed the names of his attacks. Azure Tiger Spirit, Heaven Defying Tiger Palm, and Five Spirit Tiger Finger. These attacks were unleashed upon the trapped beasts within the pit. Lao Lao arrived on the scene and expressed surprise that Feng Hao was still alive. She had believed he might not have survived. Exhausted and wounded, Feng Hao reassured Lao Lao that her disciple wasn't easily defeated, even though he came perilously close to death. He mentioned that all the medicinal ingredients he had gathered were now used up. Lao Lao responded that it was a worthwhile endeavor. Standing at the cave entrance, Lao Lao suggested they should enter. Inside, they were greeted by a gentle light emanating from the cave. They discovered something emitting a potent medicinal aroma as they moved closer to the light. It was a powerful fire dragon flower, radiating abundant restorative energy and beauty. Curious, Feng Hao asked Lao Lao if this was the dragon flower they'd been seeking. Lao Lao confirmed it was the fire dragon flower, but it was at the second level of its spiritual elixir stage. Lao Lao continued, explaining that given another hundred years, it could develop into a fire dragon spiritual fruit, a treasure of elixir king grade. Hearing the term, elixir king grade, Feng Hao's eyes lit up with excitement and joy. He was thrilled to know that such a legendary treasure existed. Lao Lao remarked that Feng Hao's expression was quite repugnant, and added that he wouldn't live long enough to witness the fire dragon flower's transformation. She decided to store the flower and used her spells to extract its essence. Feng Hao, feeling frustrated, stammered, expressing how he risked his life to obtain the flower. Lao Lao reminded him that she didn't just sit back. She fought as well, all to train him. Lao Lao instructed Feng Hao to dig out the flower's roots himself. After a moment of contemplation, he decided to proceed. Using his hands, he started digging the roots, and suddenly, a burst of energy and light erupted from the ground. The intense energy illuminated Feng Hao's face as he uncovered something extraordinary. This surprised and shocked him. Amid the emitted light and power, he noticed an object called Wu Jing. The ground opened up, 
and Wu Jing cast powerful light and energy, filling the cave. Confused, Feng Hao asked Lao Lao if the object was indeed Wu Jing, to which she confirmed its identity. Lao Lao then explained that Wu Jing was like a second life for martial artists. It formed when the Wu Yuan between heaven and earth condensed. If martial artists refined it, they could rapidly increase the amount of Wu Yuan within their bodies. This was particularly crucial when attempting to break through to the next level, as it significantly enhanced the chances of success. Filled with awe, Feng Hao picked up Wu Jing and felt its potent power and energy. Lao Lao reiterated her earlier promise that she wouldn't mistreat him, so she allowed him to keep Wu Jing. She advised him to rest in the cave for the night and continue cultivating the next day. Feng Hao expressed his gratitude and agreed to do his best. Five days later, in the forest under the bright sun, a wooden board hung on a tree, marked with various lines and symbols. In a lively chase, a giant monkey beast raced across the ground while being pursued by Feng Hao. Feng Hao was panting heavily, determined not to let the monkey escape. He knew capturing it was crucial to completing his task for the day. The monkey reached a point where there was no more path ahead, seeming trapped. Feng Hao seized the opportunity, thinking he could finally catch the monkey. As Feng Hao sprung forward to catch the running monkey, he suddenly realized that the clever creature had leaped and clung onto a tree branch above. The monkey's agile move saved it from Feng Hao's grasp. However, this sudden change in momentum sent Feng Hao precariously close to the edge of a cliff. With the cliff right before him, Feng Hao felt a shock of fear and apprehension. Quickly, Feng Hao realized the danger and told himself to halt his motion to avoid plummeting down the cliff. He swiftly pressed his foot against the ground to slow down and regain his balance, preventing a potentially disastrous fall. Finally, Feng Hao managed to halt at the cliff's edge, realizing the dangerous situation he narrowly avoided. He took a moment to catch his breath and reflected on how lucky he was to stop in time. However, as he contemplated his close call, the crafty monkey sprang onto his back from behind. Swiftly using its legs, the monkey kicked and slapped Feng Hao causing him to lose his balance and teeter on the edge. With a sudden and unexpected force, Feng Hao was propelled off the cliff, finding himself in midair and falling rapidly. As he descended, his heart raced, and he scanned the ground below to anticipate the impact. He spotted a pond shimmering beneath him, and his mind raced as he braced for the imminent collision. With a resounding splash, Feng Hao crashed into the water, the force of gravity fully taking hold. After plunging into the water, Feng Hao sighed in relief that he was alive. However, his replacement was short-lived. Despite his bruised and battered state, Feng Hao tried to explain that a demon beast had kicked him down and didn't mean to spy on the lady. Unconvinced by his explanation, the girl remained angry and threatened to gouge out his eyes to invade her privacy. Just then, a voice interrupted from behind, remarking that the girl had made it challenging for them to locate him. Turning around, they saw a person wearing sturdy metal boots who declared that, this time, the girl wouldn't escape their grasp. A group of three individuals was with the leader, who advised the injured girl to hand over whatever they were after, in exchange for sparing her life. Hearing this, Feng Hao asked the girl if she was hurt. She replied curtly, telling Feng Hao to stay silent. Defiantly, the girl stood up and suggested that their imminent deaths were now thanks to Feng Hao's loud shout. She then instructed Feng Hao to leave, and never cross her path again. The girl swiftly unsheathed her sword, ready to confront the three intimidating figures. Defiantly, she asserted that they wouldn't be able to take her life, not even in their wildest dreams. Her self-assured demeanor suggested a sense of superiority. This bold declaration frightened the three men, who appeared shaken and uncertain. Witnessing her commanding presence, Feng Hao realized that she possessed the power of Wu Jing, the same energy he encountered earlier. He understood that this woman was a skilled martial practitioner. The girl proceeded to unfurl her whip-like sword, emitting powerful energy accompanied by crackling electricity. Her weapon seemed to radiate strength and danger. One of the men hesitated, cautioning the others not to engage first, citing the girl's injuries. He believed she couldn't maintain her strength for long, suggesting they wait until the effects of Wu Jing wore off before attacking. This remark further fueled the girl's anger. Infuriated, she channeled her frustration into a potent attack known as the Shocking Thunder Whip, unleashing it with all her might. The girl's attack struck the ground, narrowly missing one of the men who skillfully dodged it. He commented on the immense strength behind the attack, while the other two companions stood back, observing the scene. Undeterred, the girl shouted at them not to flee if they were brave enough, and readied herself for another assault. The man who evaded the attack remarked that, given the girl's injuries, she couldn't reach them. He belittled her fighting abilities, suggesting that she might as well give up and accept her fate. This taunt only enraged the girl further, causing sparks to radiate from her. The group leader interjected, observing that the girl didn't appear to be in bad shape upon closer inspection, and killing her would be a waste. He proposed a morbid compromise. They promised to grant her a less painful death later if the girl accompanied them. With Lao Lao's guidance, Feng Hao acknowledged the importance of saving the girl, knowing she might benefit him. He was already strategizing a way to rescue her, recognizing that the three men were now wary of the girl's electrifying whip. Feng Hao considered the situation and decided it might be wise to lead the men to a more advantageous position for the lady, especially since her primary weapon seemed to be the whip. 
The pond and the mountain surroundings remained quiet. The lady gathered her energy, readying herself for another attack, and boldly declared her intention to eliminate all three men. Seized by the opportunity, Feng Hao leaned close to the lady's ear and suggested that she pretend to faint. This would lower the guards of the men, allowing her to catch them off guard. The lady was surprised by Feng Hao's sudden proximity and questioned how he had managed to get so close without her noticing. She cautiously agreed to his plan, warning her to kill him if he betrayed her. Feng Hao then pretended to strike her from behind, and she pretended to collapse from the feigned blow. This unexpected turn of events took aback the men. Feng Hao lifted the lady and informed the men that he was taking her away. Feng Hao couldn't resist taunting the three men, questioning their ability to handle a young lady. His mocking caught them off guard, leaving them both shocked and enraged. The leader quickly commanded his companions to attack Feng Hao. Taking swift action, Feng Hao started sprinting along the mountainside with the lady in his arms. The pursuing men followed closely behind, but Feng Hao prepared his tiger palm attack while on the move. Suddenly, he turned and unleashed his heaven-defying tiger palm on his pursuers. The resulting impact created a splash of water, soaking the three men. Meanwhile, the lady rose from her momentary rest, declaring she wasn't finished yet. With renewed determination, the lady took to the air, brandishing her weapon and launching a shocking thunder whip attack at the chasing men. The three men realized the impending danger and cried out in fear, anticipating their impending doom. The attack was connected with a burst of thunder and shocks that reverberated through the surroundings. The shocking thunder whip attack sent electric currents coursing through all three men, causing them to convulse in pain. After unleashing the attack, the lady touched down and remarked that she would have torn them apart if she could have whipped them again. Sensing the urgency, Feng Hao grabbed the lady's hand and suggested they retreat. He believed the shock wouldn't keep the men at bay for long. Back at the scene, the trio of men pondered how the lady's whip had suddenly become so potent. Removing their armor, they suspected she might have used a Wu Jing, though their leader remained bewildered by the events. As Feng Hao and the lady fled the jungle, the lady seized a tree branch to halt their escape. She urged Feng Hao to stop running, explaining that continuing would only lead them further from her intended destination. Agreeing, Feng Hao acknowledged the need to break away from their pursuers. He added that the Demon Beast mountain range was expansive, making it unlikely for the men to locate them easily. However, the lady directed her weapon toward Feng Hao, raising questions about his intentions. She demanded an explanation for his aid, suggesting he might be after the scroll she held. Feng Hao used his hand to gently nudge the weapon away from his face pointing out that her treatment of her savior was rather impolite. He clarified that he also wanted to inquire about the circumstances that led three martial practitioner mercenaries to pursue her. Nevertheless, he emphasized that his motivation was his disapproval of seeing a lady bullied by three individuals. Hearing Feng Hao's response, the lady privately mused that his thought process ran deep. She realized that Feng Hao's familiarity with the demon beast mountains and willingness to stay close to her could prove advantageous. Curious, she asked why he had been in the demon beast mountains. Considering his appearance, she also expressed concern about his safety in this dangerous territory. Feng Hao straightforwardly replied that his purpose had been to become stronger. Feng Hao further explained that he had been hunting demon beasts within the mountains to enhance his cultivation. The lady, taken aback, expressed her astonishment, mentioning that these mountains were home to high-tier demon beasts. She questioned who could have been teaching Feng Hao such a daring cultivation technique and remarked on his fortunate survival thus far. Curious about his aspirations for strength, she proposed an alternative method that promised rapid power increase. Even though it came with intense pain, she suggested it might be safer than hunting demon beasts. Feng Hao's excitement was palpable as he agreed with her idea. He privately wondered if the lady's assistance indicated a romantic interest in him. Unfortunately, the lady heard his musings and became infuriated. Angrily, she clarified that she had offered him this method to repay his kindness but he had chosen to be overly prideful rather than accept her offer. Feng Hao immediately admitted his mistake. Now, during the night he writhed in pain, shirtless and on the ground, exclaiming how agonizing it was. Amidst his cries, he claimed to smell cooked meat. Meanwhile, the lady wielded her whip, generating sparks while instructing Feng Hao to absorb each lash fully. She emphasized the importance of using her Wu Jing wisely, which she used for this purpose. A hungry beast prowled in a different part of the forest searching for prey. Catching the wind of screams from the other side of the woods, the beast's attention was drawn. Back with Feng Hao, the lady continued her whipping, explaining that the opportunity to enhance Feng Hao's body with electricity was rare, so he should bear with it a little longer. Exhausted and in pain, Feng Hao remarked that enduring 10 or 20 more lashes wouldn't make much difference, so she should proceed. Feng Hao reflected on how the effects of the medicinal plants he had consumed over the past few days seemed undone by this experience. Seeing his determination to endure the ordeal, the lady commended him for his resilience, praising his strong will. Then she released another whip, warning Feng Hao that it was coming. After about 30 minutes, the whipping continued. The lady, clearly fatigued from the relentless action, sat down and admitted she was too tired to keep going. Though injured and exhausted, Feng Hao insisted he could continue. The lady said she couldn't continue and pointed out that she had been whipping him for half an hour straight. 
She playfully suggested that Feng Hao might be developing a strange addiction to it. Feng Hao laughed it off, saying nobody would become addicted to something like that. After cleaning himself up a bit, Feng Hao proposed that the lady take a break from whipping while he went out to hunt some beasts for meat. A bear was roasting over a campfire, and Feng Hao was preparing it. The bear was fully cooked and looked delicious. As they enjoyed the grilled bear meat, the lady complimented Feng Hao's grilling technique, saying it was well done. Curious about his time in the Beast Mountain Range, she asked how long he had been there. She also noticed that Feng Hao was already at the Martial Apprentice Tier 6 level and wondered who his master was. Feng Hao responded that he didn't have a master and explained that he just felt that fighting demon beasts could help him become stronger. He said he'd run away if he couldn't defeat a demon beast. The lady, now known as Jing Yun, shared her name with Feng Hao after he revealed his as Hao Tian. She jokingly added that Jing Yun sounded nice. Jing Yun then commented on Feng Hao's unique physique, noting that most people couldn't endure continuous body tempering through electricity. She also mentioned that he had managed to tire her out with all the whipping. Feng Hao responded that he was using pharmacopoeia to heal himself. Jing Yun commented that it was good either way, and Feng Hao was fortunate to have her. She predicted that if Feng Hao continued at his current pace, he'd break through to the martial practitioner realm in less than 10 days. Feng Hao got excited and realized that this was likely why Master Lao Lao wanted him to save Jing Yun. Jing Yun pointed out that there was no need to be so shocked about the time frame. She explained that achieving the martial practitioner realm would consume a considerable amount of her Wu Jing, and afterward, Feng Hao would owe her his service. Feng Hao strongly rejected the idea of becoming anyone's servant. Jing Yun questioned what was wrong with being her servant, bragging about her high status and how many people aspired to serve her, even though few got the chance. Five days later, Jing Yan was visibly tired and drained. She told Feng Hao that this was the final time he should use her energy to break through to the martial practitioner realm. She proposed doubling the power and delivering three whip strikes to aid his breakthrough. Feng Hao bravely told Jing Yan to go ahead and do it, assuring her he'd be all right. Jing Yan unleashed the whip with all her strength, striking Feng Hao as he stood. The pain was excruciating, and Feng Hao realized that the pharmacopoeia's effects were fully activated. Despite the intense pain, he commanded Jing Yan to strike him again. Jing Yan acknowledged his request and prepared for the second whip strike, hitting him with even greater force. This time the pain was so intense that Feng Hao felt it reverberating within him. Jing Yan continued to motivate Feng Hao, urging him to endure it until the end. With determination, she called out for the third and final whip strike. The decisive strike hit Feng Hao, causing him to scream in agony. A loud explosion echoed through the forest, and a cloud of smoke surrounded the area due to the force of the strike. Amidst the smoke, Jing Yan Yan was unable to see Feng Hao. However, as the smoke cleared, she was astonished and stunned by what she saw. Feng Hao had transformed. Feng Hao had fully recovered and was now a martial practitioner cultivator. He could feel the newfound power within him, the strength of a martial practitioner. As the smoke from the earlier explosion settled, Feng Hao stood there, his transformation evident. Jing Yan asked him if he had successfully broken through, and upon confirming it, she commended his achievement. She acknowledged that he had indeed entered the practitioner realm. Feng Hao stretched his body, relishing the sensation of his newfound strength. He took a seat on the ground to assess his transformation further. Eager to test his enhanced abilities, he prepared to strike a nearby tree. He smashed the tree in half with a powerful punch, demonstrating the remarkable strength he now possessed. Observing this, Feng Hao realized that even without using the tiger movement technique, he could exert such formidable power. Surprised by Feng Hao's strength, Jing Yun asked if he was some anomaly, wondering how he could be so powerful upon entering the martial practitioner realm. Feng Hao looked at his hand and admitted that he didn't know why. Jing Yun dismissed it, noting that despite his impressive strength as a newcomer to the martial practitioner realm, he was still considered entry level. She explained that it would take about half a year for him to settle in and become stronger than early level martial practitioners fully. Since the effectiveness of the electricity tempering had likely worn off, Jing Yun suggested that Feng Hao should now go and engage in battles with demon beasts. They planned to leave the area the next day, and Feng Hao agreed. As night fell, Jing Yun slept in a cave near a campfire. Meanwhile, Feng Hao was awake and stepped outside the cave. He closed his eyes and called for Master Lao Lao. Suddenly Lao Lao appeared with a soft poof. Lao Lao teased Feng Hao, mentioning that she thought he might have forgotten about her after meeting a beautiful lady. Feng Hao assured her he had remembered, and explained that he had broken through to the martial practitioner realm. Still, in a somewhat drowsy state, Lao Lao replied that she already knew. Lao Lao mentioned it was time to bestow the Yanjue technique upon Feng Hao. Excited beyond words, Feng Hao expressed his eager waiting for this moment. Lao Lao revealed the method, which gleamed with radiant light. Overwhelmed, Feng Hao could hardly believe he now possessed the Yanjue technique. He then questioned Lao Lao, holding the method in his hands, asking if it was just a piece of old rusted metal. Curious about its grade, he inquired further. In response, Lao Lao informed him that the Yanjue technique held no specific grade. This revelation left Feng Hao slightly frustrated, feeling like he was being played with, especially considering that a method without a grade seemed useless. Lao Lao clarified that although the Yan Jue technique was considered no grade, and appeared as mere scrap metal to most people, it was different for individuals with a void martial body like Feng Hao. In his case, 
This technique could adapt and grow along with his strength, essentially equating to a heaven-grade approach due to its ability to evolve as he became more powerful. Amazed by this revelation, Feng Hao expressed his surprise, mentioning that he had never encountered the concept of improving a technique before, and he was unsure if Lao Lao was telling the truth. Lao Lao responded by encouraging Feng Hao to open and witness the Yan Zhui technique himself. Puzzled, Feng Hao wondered how to open it. Lao Lao instructed him to use the Wu Jing energy he had obtained earlier, sit in a cross-legged position, and absorb the energy from the Wu Jing. Following her guidance, Feng Hao followed the steps she provided. Lao Lao continued, explaining that Feng Hao should transfer the energy into the Yan Zhui technique once the energy is absorbed. Feng Hao followed the instructions meticulously, moving the power into the Yan Zhui technique as directed. Lao Lao explained that the Yan Zhui technique would naturally manifest in Feng Hao's mind, which indeed happened. Feng Hao was enveloped by a surge of energy and power inside his consciousness. Finding himself in this space, he adopted a cross-legged position to meditate within this energy field. Feng Hao sensed the energy flowing into his body and mind as he pondered. The process prompted him to start perspiring, yet he persisted with the meditation, focusing on the energy surrounding him. While immersed in his meditation, Feng Hao realized that being in the martial practitioner realm was a prerequisite for cultivating this technique. Otherwise, the sheer energy would cause his body to explode. With determination, he shouted, Virtual martial body, open! In response, a surge of energy enveloped him, entering his body and filling him. Astonished by the experience, Feng Hao turned to Lao, inquiring about the phenomenon. Lao Lao's smile revealed that he had successfully broken through from the initial to the early story of martial apprenticeship. Lao Lao explained that this breakthrough resulted from combining the Yan Zhui and Wu Jing techniques. She emphasized that this method was less painful than using electricity for cultivation, yielding the same rapid progress. However, she cautioned Feng Hao that he would now require a significant amount of Wu Jing energy to continue cultivating, or he might face negative consequences. Feng Hao expressed surprise, wondering why Lao Lao hadn't mentioned this earlier, and reflected that acquiring Yan Zhui was quite resource intensive. Despite the newfound challenges, Feng Hao was determined to persevere. He resolved to diligently pursue Wu Jing's energy to ensure his progress and survival. As the morning sun illuminated the landscape between the mountains, Feng Hao stood in the water, deep in his martial stance. Determination filled his thoughts as he reflected on how he had surpassed his previous limits and entered the martial practitioner realm. The memory of his past humiliation fueled his resolve to seek revenge. Feng Hao prepared to practice the heaven-defying tiger palm attack. His focused expression shows his determination. The force of his practice resounded, catching the attention of Jing Yan, who woke up startled, fearing that their pursuers had found them. Upon realizing it was just Feng Hao practicing, she understood that his excitement must stem from his recent breakthrough. However, Jing Yan sensed a difference in Feng Hao's demeanor from the previous day. She observed that he didn't seem as jubilant as she anticipated. Feng Hao noticed Jing Yan's awakening and apologized for disturbing her. Jing Yan, lost in her thoughts, contemplated how Feng Hao reached the early stage of the martial practitioner realm so quickly. Unable to contain her curiosity, Jing Yan directly addressed Feng Hao, asking him to come clean about how he achieved such rapid improvement. She wondered if he had transformed into a demon beast, or if there was another reason behind his exceptional progress. Feng Hao found himself puzzled by Jing Yan's suspicions. He playfully responded that he was just a genius, and jokingly threatened to eat her if she kept calling him a demon beast. By recognizing his humor, Jing Yan went along with the banter, teasing that it was already impressive for a baby like him to resist the urge to devour her. Feng Hao then inquired about their next steps, and Jing Yan suggested they pack up and continue their journey since they had spent quite some time in one place. Agreeing, Feng Hao was ready to move on. However, Jing Yan noticed his rather unpleasant odor and handed him some of her clothes, mentioning that they had been used when disguising herself as a man. Feng Hao changed into the clothes shortly, remarking that they fit well. Now dressed in an elegant dress, Feng Hao's appearance transformed. Jing Yan observed him and thought about how the saying clothes make the man honestly held weight, considering his newfound beauty. With their preparations complete, Feng Hao urged Jing Yan to start their journey. The two of them set out through the forest, going onward. Feng Hao asked Jing Yan what she had been searching for and why she had not tried to find it in the past few days. Jing Yan explained that this particular thing she was after could only be acquired at a specific time, and she warned Feng Hao not to get any ideas about it. Suddenly Feng Hao sensed something amiss and pulled Jing Yan behind him. Jing Yan felt a bit awkward due to the sudden closeness. Feng Hao whispered that there were people up ahead, and he could smell a strong scent of blood in the air. Jing Yan acknowledged his warning. Hiding in the bushes, Jing Yan and Feng Hao observed two men standing over a lifeless body. These men were the same ones they had encountered before, and it appeared they had killed someone and taken a map from the victim. One of the men expressed excitement, anticipating wealth from this endeavor, and mentioned that they would find some women once they were successful. The other man questioned how things were progressing on their boss's side and voiced concerns about being discovered. 
The first man dismissed the worry, stating they needn't be concerned anymore. He explained that they wouldn't be caught if they acted quickly, but delaying could lead to trouble. Observing the scene, Feng Hao commented that the map they found must be the treasure map, and he suggested they follow the chasers. Jing Yan agreed, emphasizing that since they had pursued her for so long, it was time to turn the tables and collect some interest. As night fell and the sun set, the two chasers entered a cave, convinced that the treasure was within their grasp. Their excitement grew as they believed riches were finally within reach. Jing Yan informed Feng Hao that they had entered the cave, and they began to spy on them. Feng Hao, while hidden and watching alongside Jing Yan, advised caution. He detected the presence of nearby demon beasts, and suggested waiting a bit longer before proceeding. Back in the cave, the chasers focused on searching for treasure. Suddenly a dark shadow approached behind one of the chasers. Before the chaser could react, the shadow attacked with swift and overwhelming power. The chaser's energy dissipated as he fell, lifeless. Witnessing this shocking turn, the remaining chaser was filled with fear and disbelief. The remaining chaser had been gripped by fear as he witnessed the horrifying spectacle. He had seen the massive metal-armed ape, its jaws stained with his friend's remains, its ominous gaze fixed upon him. Consumed by terror, he uttered a desperate cry for help and attempted to flee. However, in a swift and brutal turn of events, the metal-armed ape pounced on its prey, tearing the unfortunate chaser apart in a gruesome display that painted the surroundings with blood splatters. Feng Hao and Jing Yan, who had been concealed and observing the scene, were horrified by the macabre sight that unfolded before them. The metal-armed ape, reveling in its vicious triumph, filled the air with eerie sounds of its gleeful victory. As they processed the shock of what they had just witnessed, Feng Hao and Jing Yan found themselves in disbelief, struggling to comprehend the brutality of the situation. Feng Hao quickly assessed the situation, realizing the ape's overwhelming power, comparable to that of a high-level martial practitioner. He turned to Jing Yan, conveying his apprehensions about their ability to face such a formidable opponent. Expressing caution, he suggested that retreating would be the wisest course to ensure their safety. Jing Yan met his concern with unwavering determination. She asserted her self-assuredness, emphasizing that while Feng Hao might choose to withdraw, she had a secret weapon up her sleeve. Amidst this tense confrontation, the metal-armed ape remained preoccupied with its thoughts, its demeanor enigmatic and unpredictable. Taking advantage of the moment, Jing Yan seized the opportunity to make her move. Emerging from her hidden vantage point, she ascended a prominent rock, positioning herself with poise and purpose. With a burst of energy, she vaulted into the air, her whip poised and ready to strike. Skillfully wielding her whip, she ensnared the metal-armed ape's hand, showcasing her agility and strength. Driven by her resolve, Jing Yan vowed to exhibit the full extent of her power and unwavering determination to confront the menace before her. Channeling her energy, she concentrated her focus and summoned a potent attack spell, the formidable Shocking Thunder Whip. Jing Yan unleashed the attack with a deft and forceful motion, guiding the surge of energy along the length of her whip. The energy surged forth with tremendous force, striking the metal-armed ape with an impact reverberating through the air. The metal ape screamed in agony as it experienced the intense shock from Jing Yan's powerful attack. Enraged and in pain, the ape's fury grew. Feng Hao, deeply concerned for Jing Yan's safety, stepped forward and warned her that her attack might provoke the ape to retaliate. He quickly attacked, employing the heaven-defying tiger technique against the ferocious creature. Unfazed by Feng Hao's skepticism, Jing Yan remained resolute and determined. She took out a potent pearl, poured her energy into it, and prepared to unleash an even mightier attack. With unwavering focus, Jing Yan hurled the charged pearl toward the metal ape with all her strength. She cried out, asserting that the ape must succumb to its demise. Upon impact, the pearl detonated with a burst of vibrant purple energy, engulfing the metal ape in a blazing spectacle. The powerful energy consumed the creature's body, emitting cries of anguish. Jing Yan stood confident, convinced that her attack affected the formidable metal ape. Gradually, the once menacing creature collapsed to the ground, lifeless and severely charred by the force of Jing Yan's assault. Upon witnessing the scene, Jing Yan seized the opportunity to boast about her triumph over the metal-armed ape referring to it as a furry monkey that had never tasted defeat. She proudly recounted her victory over a martial master, seemingly seeking to impress Feng Hao with her accomplishments. As she revealed her narrative, Jing Yan anticipated Feng Hao's astonishment. Yet when she glanced back to gauge his reaction, she was met with an unexpected sight. Feng Hao was nowhere to be seen. Unbeknownst to Jing Yan, Feng Hao had advanced towards the charred remains of the metal-armed ape, a glimmer of excitement evident in his eyes. He enthusiastically remarked on the creature's appearance, noting that its color and aroma indicated that it had been perfectly cooked. Feng Hao even went so far as to label it a martial practitioner-grade delicacy, extending an offer to Jing Yan to partake in the feast. Jing Yan's hand swung in an unexpected arc, connecting with Feng Hao's head in a swift strike. She expressed her regret in the aftermath of the blow, deeming it a mistake to have put up such a fierce fight if Feng Hao wouldn't even offer a word of praise. 
Nursing the bump on his head resulting from Jing Yan's admonishing blow, Feng Hao explained. He admitted to his excitement, clarifying that he had never before sampled such fare, which had contributed to his unbridled enthusiasm. As Feng Hao's thoughts wandered within his mind, Lao Lao's voice emerged addressing him. She explained that Jing Yan had employed a Yi Jing, a superior variant of the ordinary Wu Jing. Lao Lao encouraged Feng Hao to stay close to Jing Yan and reap the benefits of her abilities. Feng Hao responded hesitantly, expressing concern about appearing too greedy. Lao Lao offered a counter perspective, suggesting that if Feng Hao felt he was taking advantage of Jing Yan, he could assist her in return. Playfully, she noted that Jing Yan's cuteness presented an opportunity that Feng Hao shouldn't let slip away. This teasing remark prompted a bashful reaction from Feng Hao, who promptly denied having any affection for Jing Yan. Amidst this inner dialogue, Jing Yan called Feng Hao, prompting his excited agreement to approach her. With Jing Yan's guidance, Feng Hao's gaze fell upon an entrance that bore numerous scratch and claw marks, indicative of the struggles there had taken place. Jing Yan identified these marks as sword strikes, hinting that the cave's original possessor had been a cultivator. Progressing further, Feng Hao's discovery continued as they encountered a treasure box in the cave. Feng Hao eagerly asked Jing Yan if he could open the treasure box, his curiosity burning. However, Jing Yan beat him to it, swiftly cracking it open. She innocently apologized, citing her quick hands as the reason. Yet, as the box revealed its contents, a powerful light emerged, casting a glow on both faces. Filled with excitement, Feng Hao exclaimed that it was a secret technique. Picking up the revealed book, he noted that it was a technique for a fierce transformation. Curious, he wondered if it was a heaven-grade secret technique. However, Jing Yan's response carried a tinge of disappointment. She remarked that it was just worthless stuff, feeling let down as she mentioned using her Yi Jing. Refusing to believe it was worthless, Feng Hao countered that a master left behind the technique and couldn't be rubbish. Jing Yan countered suggesting that only one in ten people could genuinely succeed in learning such a dubious technique. With a hint of wisdom, she added that while success might bring benefits, failure could result in a fatal explosion. She explained that this technique involves using a demon beast Yao Jing to condense energy within a pill, utilizing the body as a medium to control the potentially violent transformation. Jing Yan continued by sharing that the energy within a Yao Jing is forceful and unstable. Absorbing it directly into the body is extremely risky. Moreover, crafting an ordinary Huang-grade violent transformation pill demands significant time and energy. The process becomes even more demanding when working with higher-grade pills. She added that a Wang-grade pill's strength is only about one-tenth of a Yi Jing's, yet it's slightly more potent than a Wu Jing. However, even with the involvement of a low-tier demon beast Yao Jing, the resulting pill wouldn't exceed a mere one-hundredth of the strength of a Yi Jing. She explained that while the highest-tier Earth-grade demon blood pill is rich in Wu Yuan and can significantly enhance one's strength over an extended period, very few people can condense an Earth-grade pill. Jing Yan concluded by stating that given the low probability of success, Attempting to learn this technique would be akin to gambling with one's life. The effort invested could yield unfavorable results, making it essentially worthless. Feng Hao was surprised by Jing Yun's depth of knowledge and considered the possibility that she might already possess the technique. To his amazement, Jing Yun pointed at the piece of paper within the treasure box, revealing that all the information was written on that paper. Feng Hao realized that she had been reading from it all along. Lao Lao then communicated with Feng Hao's thoughts, explaining that while Jing Yun's explanation was partially correct, it needed to be completed. Lao Lao clarified that violent transformation pills could reach a higher grade than higher earth grade. Still, this knowledge was limited due to the world's scarcity of heaven grade demon crystal pills. Lao Lao added that with the potential of the violent transformation pill to enhance strength significantly, combined with Feng Hao's martial body and pharmacopoeia, condensing the pill shouldn't pose a significant challenge. Upon hearing this, Feng Hao became excited and believed the technique suited him. Observing his joyful expression, Jing Yan inquired about his thoughts. Feng Hao responded by expressing his enthusiasm for the technique. Jing Yan, sensing his happiness, stated that since her forte lay in wealth, she didn't require this particular technique. Feng Hao questioned Jing Yan whether she believed anyone could use Wu Jing as casually as eating candy. His excitement evident, Feng Hao expressed his eagerness to try the violent transformation technique. He inquired whether the corpse of the metal-armed ape contained a Yao Jing. Jing Yan confirmed it did, and handed the tier 4 Yao Jing to Feng Hao. Jing Yan appeared somewhat disappointed and concerned, mentioning that she would provide him with the tier 4 Yao Jing today if he were determined to put himself in danger. Feng Hao thanked Jing Yan for her assistance. Jing Yan privately contemplated that if Feng Hao succeeded in condensing the pill, her hypothesis would be correct. Feng Hao closed his eyes and combined the Yao Jing with the technique, emitting radiant energy. In a meditative state, Feng Hao stood up, astonished by the immense energy unleashed by the Yao Jing, causing waves of power to ripple around him. Lao Lao's voice resounded in Feng Hao's mind chastising him for becoming distracted. Lao Lao emphasized that the energy from the Yao Jing was highly volatile and urged Feng Hao to maintain complete focus to prevent any adverse reactions. Following Lao Lao's guidance, Feng Hao followed the technique's prescribed circulation method, releasing Wu Yuan energy. Lao Lao advised him to activate the void martial art 
and enhance his devouring strength. Feng Hao followed suit as instructed. Lao Lao suggested incorporating assistance from spirit elixirs refined by the pharmacopoeia. During this process, Feng Hao absorbed a substantial amount of energy from Wu Yuan. Lao Lao instructed him to extract every last bit of energy from the Yao Jing. With determination, Feng Hao diligently drew in the energy from the Yao Jing. He queried Lao Lao about the formation of the pill. Lao Lao responded that it wasn't sufficient, urging him to persist in condensation. Jing Yan was utterly astonished as she witnessed the pill forming in Feng Hao's hand, while he remained engrossed. She was amazed that Feng Hao was condensing a pill before her eyes. Jing Yan's earlier speculation about Feng Hao being an alchemist appeared correct, explaining his ability to endure electricity-based body tempering. Witnessing the pill taking shape, Jing Yan was further astounded to realize that Feng Hao had successfully condensed a Exuan-grade violent blood pill. Despite her amazement, a tinge of jealousy crept in, as Jing Yan contemplated Feng Hao's alchemy skills and wondered about his complex background and identity. Abruptly, the pill cracked with surging energy and burst open. Jing Yan's shock intensified as she observed Feng Hao continuing to upgrade the pill's grade. She found it unbelievable that Feng Hao, who had just entered the martial practitioner realm, could possess the capabilities of a heaven-grade alchemist. This notion challenged her understanding. Meanwhile, someone approached the cave. It was the leader of the chasers, and he stood outside, detecting sounds from within. The leader recognized the presence of several individuals and assumed that the two traitors hadn't left the area. Still grappling with the idea of Feng Hao, potentially being a heaven-grade alchemist, Jing Yan considered the possibility that his identity could be much more significant than she thought. Inside the cave, the chasers conducted their search for their fellow traitors. One sensed lingering human auras and concluded that the traitors shouldn't have left yet. The leader fell silent, alerting the others to a distinct scent of blood wafting ahead. As the group of chasers advanced cautiously, their astonishment grew. Before them lay the dismembered and lifeless bodies of their fellow traitors scattered on the ground. The group's leader immediately urged everyone to be vigilant, suspecting that the traitors fell victim to a formidable demon beast. With a sharp command, he directed his companions to draw the creature out of hiding by creating noise. The chasers collectively struck their swords and weapons against the cave walls, generating a cacophony to lure the beast. The echoing clatter of weaponry reached Jing Yan's ears, filling her with unease. She began to fear that the chasers had finally caught up to them. Panicking, Jing Yan shouted urgently at Feng Hao, expressing her concern that his ongoing refining process might be jeopardized if he was interrupted. She felt trapped, unsure of what action to take, as staying and potentially dying with Feng Hao wasn't an option. Meanwhile, Feng Hao remained fully engrossed in condensing the pill, maintaining intense concentration. Jing Yan's frustration boiled over, and she swore that if they managed to survive this ordeal, Feng Hao would owe her for the rest of his life. Bracing herself for a confrontation, Jing Yan readied herself to face the approaching chasers. Observing the situation, Lao Lao acknowledged Jing Yan's determination and commented that she was pretty impressive and that Feng Hao was fortunate to have her by his side. Within the cave, the chasers continued their search for the elusive beast. Hidden from sight, Jing Yan discreetly observed the group of eight chasers. Although individually could have been stronger, their numerical advantage posed a challenge. Jing Yan devised a plan to eliminate them separately using her limited Wu Jing energy, taking cover behind a rock. She concentrated the Ujing power in her hand and hurled it at the chasers. Swiftly, she seized one of the chasers by the neck with her whip, incapacitating him. Another chaser became alerted to a sound and questioned his companion, who dismissed it as mere imagination. Jing Yan recognized this as an opportunity to proceed with her strategy of minimizing energy consumption. Waiting patiently, she struck the second chaser from behind, catching him off guard. However, her attack was thwarted by a shout of caution. Turning around, the opponent blocked her assault with an axe. With a deft movement of his axe, the person seized Jing Yan's whip and pulled her toward him, her weapon still attached. Jing Yan was taken aback by this unexpected maneuver, unsure how he managed it. He tightened his grip on her neck and chuckled, mocking her belief that her minor Wu Jing attack would go unnoticed. He taunted her, revealing that even the slightest energy disturbance would catch his attention, and he was well aware of her identity when she attacked. The leader's grip on Jing Yan's neck tightened further as he relished his triumph, asserting his intent to end her life and claim the treasure. He launched another assault on Jing Yan, inflicting pain upon her. He eventually released her, letting her fall to the ground, injured and in agony. Despite the pain, Jing Yan persevered, focusing on the hope that Feng Hao would arrive in time to save her from this dire situation. Outside the cave, the peaceful scene was disrupted by a sudden, piercing scream of pain that echoed through the air. The chaser leader, gripping Jing Yan tightly, was now writhing in agony, his hands severely injured and blood splattering around. As the leader endured the pain, he spotted Feng Hao's determined figure emerging again. Feng Hao was carrying Jing Yan protectively in his arms as he swiftly moved to rescue her from the leader's grasp. The other chasers, incensed by their leader's suffering, leaped into action with weapons, ready to attack Feng Hao. 
Undeterred by the oncoming threat, Feng Hao glanced back with a look of vengeance. He remarked that the assailants were making far too much noise. With a surge of energy, Feng Hao readied his fist and charged at the attackers. He struck one of them with incredible force in a burst of power, creating a massive hole in the attacker's body as his fist passed through. Amidst the chaos, another attacker cried out and attacked Feng Hao. Responding swiftly, Feng Hao channeled his power and delivered another devastating punch, creating another hole in the attacker's body as his fist pierced through. Throughout these intense moments, Feng Hao remained composed and in control. As the situation escalated, the remaining attacker became visibly shaken and fearful. From behind, the group leader's voice pierced the air, urging his comrades to unite and overwhelm Feng Hao with their combined assault. Jing Yan's voice rang out, warning Feng Hao of an attacker approaching from behind. With attackers closing in from all sides, Feng Hao concentrated his energy and unleashed the power of Azure Fury in his fist. He struck the ground with immense force, causing it to rupture and crack open. The ground upheaval caught the airborne attackers off guard, and they were tossed into disarray as the shattered terrain engulfed them, scattering the group and effectively halting their coordinated attack. Witnessing Feng Hao's remarkable display of power, the leader feared for his life. Suddenly, Feng Hao appeared before the leader, his tiger finger attack ready. Feng Hao executed the attack swiftly and precisely, slashing the leader's neck. His expression remained composed and focused, as if he was an expert in such matters. However, after the intense confrontation, Feng Hao's energy was depleted, causing him to collapse onto the ground. Night fell, and a gentle fire illuminated the cave. Feng Hao gradually regained consciousness. Jing Yan was by his side, offering the grilled fish that she had prepared. She informed Feng Hao that he woke up just in time, and that she had cleaned his blood-stained clothes, which were still drying. As Feng Hao rubbed his head, he inquired about his surroundings, wondering if he had fainted and questioning the change in his attire. Jing Yan explained that she had washed his clothes, which were still stained, and encouraged him to eat the fish she had grilled. Grateful for her care, Feng Hao accepted the fish and expressed his thanks to Jing. Jing Yan expressed her concern, mentioning that due to Feng Hao using a high-grade violent blood pill, he had temporarily entered the martial master realm. This had caused him to faint because his body couldn't handle such immense power. Feng Hao then shifted the conversation by asking about the flavor of the grilled fish. This response irritated Jing Yan, and she retorted that she had gone to the trouble of examining the fish for him, yet he was still complaining. She advised him to listen to her more attentively next time. Jing Yan then boasted that her guess was correct. She explained that with his physique resembling that of a martial practitioner, Feng Hao couldn't have cultivated his inner core. Even with the violent transformation pill, he would have exploded and died if he hadn't consumed elixirs or used pharmacopoeia to heal his body. Shocked by Jing Yan's accuracy, Feng Hao realized she was right about his identity. Jing Yan mentioned that their shared near-death experience had brought them closer and prompted Feng Hao to reveal his true self. Lao Lao added that Feng Hao's behavior, such as collecting herbs along the way, indicated that he was more than just a mountain dweller. Lao Lao speculated that Feng Hao might use a unique ring to store spices. Feng Hao admitted that his real name was Feng Hao and belonged to the Feng family in Yulan City. He acknowledged his identity as an alchemist, but couldn't provide more details. In turn, he asked Jing Yan about her reality. Jing Yan disclosed her name as Yan Jing, but implied that revealing her identity wasn't convenient for her. She hinted that she might come from a prestigious, wealthy, and influential family. Feng Hao found this plausible and thought about slapping her multiple times. Feng Hao curiously asked Jing Yan about her purpose in the Demon Beast Mountains. Jing Yan revealed that she was searching for a thousand-year-old Red King Lotus. Feng Hao was astonished by this revelation, as the Red King Lotus was a legendary and top-grade medicinal herb. He then playfully suggested that Jing Yan could give him two or three of these lotuses, since he was an alchemist with a high demand for herbs. Jing Yan responded by playfully kicking Feng Hao and teasing him to go far away, emphasizing that even one Red King Lotus was extremely valuable. Feng Hao tried to plead with her. But Jing Yan said she would grant his wish for the Red King Lotus under one condition. Feng Hao quickly agreed without knowing the condition. Jing Yan then unveiled her proposal. She would give Feng Hao the Red King Lotus if he became their family's exclusive alchemist. Feng Hao became perplexed upon hearing the term exclusive alchemist. Jing Yan quickly assured him that there was no need to worry as it was nothing dangerous. She explained that it was simply a title and that he would receive a generous supply of rare and valuable materials to work with. Feng Hao contemplated her offer. Jing Yan mentioned that she could take the lotuses to another alchemist for a deal if he weren't interested. Feng Hao, without hesitation, agreed to the proposal. Jing Yan's happiness and excitement were evident, but Feng Hao wondered if he had unknowingly entered a big trap. Jing Yan then disappeared, mentioning that the red lotus should be fully matured soon and they should head there the following day. She advised Feng Hao to rest. Feng Hao suggested that Jing Yan should sleep first and that he needed to take care of something. Outside, Feng Hao attempted to communicate with Lao Lao, asking if there were any martial techniques similar to the violent transformation technique that could rapidly enhance one's power. Lao Lao chuckled, noting that Feng Hao enjoyed the feeling of strength. Gazing at his hands, Feng Hao admitted to it. Recalling the sensation of going on a powerful rampage, Lao Lao expressed concern about this, 
Lao Lao then imparted a technique to Feng Hao, advising him to take it. Lao Lao explained that his method was called Rolling Thunder, a high-grade Xuan tier martial technique. It was quicker than the tiger spirit and could rapidly boost one's power. However, Lao Lao warned Feng Hao that his body was still fragile and that using this technique might strain it. Yet if Feng Hao had enough elixirs, he could temporarily reach a level close to that of a martial master. Lao Lao highlighted that the technique's primary advantage was its substantial enhancement of agility, which could be helpful in self-defense. Feng Hao examined the process, recognizing its five parts. One section could increase power by a factor of one. Combining this with the strengthening from his demon blood pill and the healing from the pharmacopoeia, Feng Hao realized that he only needed to maintain his mental state while using it. With a contented expression, Feng Hao mused that mastering this technique might give him the edge to defeat Yun Ying. He expressed gratitude to Lao Lao, who disappeared into thin air. Feng Hao then spoke to himself, deciding to wait until he obtained the Red Lotus before seeking Lao Lao's guidance again. After ten days of travel, a rustling sound emanated from behind the mountains. Feng Hao and Jing Yan were perched on a tree, exhausted from their journey. Feng Hao inquired how much farther they must travel, and Jing Yan replied that they were close, but needed the exact location of the lotus. Feeling weary, Feng Hao questioned how they would find the lotus without a keen sense of smell. Jing Yan reassured him, explaining that they only needed to wait. Suddenly, a resounding boom echoed through the sky, causing the mountains to shake vigorously. Holding onto tree branches, Feng Hao and Jing Yan braced themselves. While Feng Hao believed it was an earthquake, Jing Yan informed him that the Red Lotus was maturing. She emphasized that there would be a single opportunity and a fierce battle to seize it. Urgently, Jing Yan instructed Feng Hao to be swift and take action. Following Jing Yan's lead, Feng Hao asked whom they would snatch the lotus from and if there were any nearby people they needed to confront. As they moved forward, Jing Yan told him they wouldn't deal with people. Halting on a tree branch, Jing Yan explained that even ten martial grandmasters might need help with the situation ahead. She revealed that there were martial spirit realm demon beasts up on the ground line dragon and the red blazing demon tiger. The two beasts were locked in a fierce battle, attacking each other relentlessly. Watching this spectacle from a distance on a tree, Feng Hao realized that the absence of a map was due to the constant upheaval caused by the beast's fight. Jing Yan inquired if Feng Hao could smell the lotus fragrance from this distance. Feng Hao admitted that he couldn't detect a faint hint of the lotus fragrance. He explained that the strong smell of something else was overpowering it. As the tiger and dragon beasts continued their fight, their battle drew closer to where Feng Hao and Jing Yan were positioned on a tree. The dragon beast launched an attack against the tiger, and due to their proximity, the attack hit the tree as well, causing Jing Yan to fall off. Thankfully, Feng Hao caught her in his arms and remarked on the reckless nature of the two massive demon beasts. While holding Jing Yan, he suggested they should move away a bit, as a single strike from the beasts could be fatal. Carefully, Feng Hao landed with Jing Yan on another tree branch, a bit further from the ongoing battle between the beasts. Jing Yan asked Feng Hao what they should do in this situation. She was worried that more than half an hour had passed, and feared the battling beasts might destroy the lotus. Feng Hao explained that the strong smell of sulfur from the volcanic region was masking the fragrance of the lotus. Suddenly, a realization dawned on him as he mentioned, volcanic region. Feng Hao understood that the Red Lotus required a hot environment to thrive, and this area was known for its volcanoes. He concluded that it was highly likely that the Red Lotus was located within a volcano. Feng Hao further explained that the overpowering scent they detected most likely came from the volcano due to the strong sulfur smell. Jing Yan realized that the overpowering scent of the volcano might have masked the lotus's fragrance, making it difficult for Feng Hao to smell it. She then asked about their plan for reaching the volcano and dealing with the two fighting beasts. Feng Hao explained that charging indirectly would be too dangerous, and even a light attack from the beasts could be fatal. He suggested circling the jungle instead. Jing Yan pointed out that the jungle likely had many beasts attracted by the lotus's scent, so they should cross it quickly. Feng Hao agreed, and they immediately set off. They swiftly navigated through the trees, branches, and other demon beasts, avoiding confrontation. Their pace was fast as they skillfully avoided any potential threats. Feng Hao and Jing Yan encountered more demon beasts as they continued their journey. A four-armed demon beast leaped at them, but Feng Hao swiftly defeated it with his attack. Soon after, a centipede-like demon beast also tried to attack them, but Feng Hao quickly slashed it in half. Despite their efforts, the number of demon beasts around them kept increasing. Amidst the chaos, Feng Hao remarked that the demon beasts were becoming more numerous. However, before he could finish, Jing Yan yelled and unleashed a powerful attack that annihilated the remaining approaching beasts leaving them dismembered and lifeless. She urged Feng Hao to keep moving without stopping. Pressing forward, Feng Hao and Jing Yan eventually arrived at the volcano's edge just as it was about to erupt. Standing at the precipice, Feng Hao took in sight before him and realized they had finally reached the volcano's vent, where the Red King Lotus was likely to be found. Jing Yan anxiously urged Feng Hao to quickly locate the Red King Lotus reminding him of the potential danger posed by more demon beasts being attracted to the area. Feng Hao reassured Jing Yan that he had it under control. Scanning the surroundings, he spotted the Red King Lotus on a rock amidst the magma. The lotus was emitting intense heat, 
and a powerful aura. Jingyan was concerned about the extreme heat and difficulty reaching the lotus safely. She worried that the high temperatures might cause them to burn to death before they could even get close. In response, Feng Hao calmed her worries and decided to take on the task himself. He removed his shirt and prepared to descend into the volcano. With determination, Feng Hao began to meditate, focusing his attention on the herbs stored in his spatial storage ring. He also fully activated his pharmacopoeia ability. Feng Hao channeled his void martial body, readying himself for the challenging task ahead. Observing this, Jing Yan speculated whether Feng Hao planned to use his pharmacopoeia ability to counteract the damage caused by the scorching magma. However, Feng Hao's response surprised her. He let out an aggressive laugh and declared that encountering a thousand-year-old king of medicines was an opportunity of a lifetime, one he couldn't simply pass up. With determination in his eyes, Feng Hao summoned his full power and unleashed the rolling thunder technique, generating waves of thunderous energy around him. He activated the technique on himself and boldly dove into the magma. Watching this, Jing Yan was amazed by the lightning-like martial technique Feng Hao was using. She wondered how he possessed such advanced techniques, and if he still had hidden powers yet to be revealed. In the volcano's heart, Feng Hao's movements mirrored the lightning speed as he deftly maneuvered over rocks and cliffs. His utilization of the rolling thunder technique came at a cost, causing discomfort in his body. He halted briefly, acknowledging the painful burns from the intense heat, yet recognizing that they were minor compared to the toll of the rolling thunder technique. He resolved to push forward at an even faster pace. Perched at the volcano's edge, Jing Yan watched intently as Feng Hao raced toward the lotus, skillfully navigating through the churning lava and swirling smoke. Impressed by his incredible speed, she marveled at how a martial practitioner at an early level could exhibit such agility. Jing Yan contemplated the many hidden facets of Feng Hao's abilities, wondering how many more secrets he kept from her. Meanwhile, the Red King Lotus teetered on the brink of destruction, its proximity to the encroaching lava threatening to consume it. With unrelenting determination, Feng Hao hurtled towards the lotus, propelled by a speed reminiscent of thunder. Upon reaching the Red King Lotus, Feng Hao gazed at it up close for the first time. In his mind, Lao Lao advised him to gather the power of the pharmacopoeia in his hands and carefully envelop the lotus with it. Feng Hao understood the urgency and accepted Lao Lao's guidance. With a swift and cautious motion, he plucked the Red King Lotus from its place. However, as he did so, a sudden earthquake shook the ground and the entire volcano was chaotic. Confusion filled Feng Hao as he tried to comprehend the situation around him. Lao Lao's voice echoed in his mind, explaining that picking the lotus had disrupted the energy in the area, destabilizing the volcano. She added that Feng Hao should act quickly. He must stow the lotus in his spatial storage ring and evacuate the site before it was too late. Feng Hao acted swiftly, storing the Red King Lotus within his ring. The intensity of the lava had increased significantly, creating waves of molten rock that Feng Hao skillfully dodged as he made his way back. Jing Yan watched anxiously, urging Feng Hao to hasten his pace as the approaching giant demon beasts detected the disturbance in the area. Amidst the boiling and tumultuous lava, Feng Hao employed agile moves to navigate the hazardous terrain. He even found a certain exhilaration in the dangerous situation, jesting that perhaps the volcano held him in high regard for it to unleash such ferocity. With resolve, Feng Hao combined techniques in his hand, releasing the potent power of the heaven-defying tiger thunder onto the seething lava. Though this caused adverse reactions within him, the lava's fury remained undeterred, and another wave of molten lava surged toward him. Just as the molten wave inched closer to Feng Hao, he found himself in a dire situation, realizing that the energy depletion from using rolling thunder and the expended medicinal energy might lead to his demise. However, in a timely act of rescue, Jing Yan's whip suddenly appeared, snatching Feng Hao to safety. She emphatically declared that she would only let Feng Hao die after obtaining the Red Lotus first. Jing Yan successfully removed him from harm's way with a forceful pull. Breathing a sigh of relief, Jing Yan expressed that Feng Hao might have perished if she hadn't been by his side. Feng Hao chuckled, agreeing that they made quite the team. The volcano unleashed a tremendous eruption with a resounding boom as they exchanged words. At that moment, Feng Hao comprehended that even a slight delay on his part could have resulted in his demise. Suddenly, a roar echoed from behind, catching Feng Hao's attention. It was the red blazing tiger demon beast. With a concerned expression, Feng Hao remarked that the red tiger beast must have settled its own battle, and now more troubles had arisen. He added with a hint of frustration that it seemed like challenges never came one at a time. While observing the situation, Jing Yan expressed her uncertainty about what to do next. She pointed out that escaping from the approaching tiger wasn't an option. Feeling exasperated, Feng Hao remarked that it seemed as though life's trials were designed by a higher plan, testing him at every turn. Driven by a surge of determination and anger, Feng Hao took drastic action. He consumed a demonic blood pill, activated Demonify, and fully unleashed the power of the first part of his rolling thunder technique. Concerned for his well-being, Jing Yan pleaded with Feng Hao to halt. Fearing that he might endanger his life with such intense exertion, Lao Lao's voice echoed in Feng Hao's thoughts, cautioning him that he didn't have any elixirs left to heal himself and that continuing to exert himself this way could lead to difficult-to-heal wounds. Despite the warning, 
Feng Hao was overcome with intense energy and determination. He shouted that he refused to wait for death and was willing to risk his life for survival. At that moment, with intense energy and determination, he shouted that he refused to wait for death and was willing to risk his life for survival. At that moment, a powerful eruption of lava shook the surroundings. The enraged red tiger demon beast attacked with a fierce roar. Other nearby beasts were also drawn to the volcanic activity, sensing the commotion. Jing Yan observed the unfolding chaos and remarked that the situation attracted more creatures. Amidst the turmoil, Feng Hao embraced the opportunity, fully committed to the technique where he was teetering between life and death. His transformation intensified, turning him into a dark, powerful entity filled with energy and determination. Feng Hao swiftly scooped Jing Yan in his arms, advising her to hold on tightly and be cautious not to fall. He began running at lightning-fast speed, with the enraged tiger demon beast hot on their heels. Other demon beasts in the vicinity caught sight of the chase and joined in pursuing Feng Hao and Jing Yan. Fueled by anger, Feng Hao's eyes were ablaze as he declared that anyone obstructed their path would meet their end. He pushed forward with incredible speed, the tiger demon beast relentlessly giving chase. While watching the approaching threat, Jing Yan urgently alerted Feng Hao to its proximity. The tiger demon beast readied a powerful attack and launched it with full force. The resulting impact created a deafening boom, yet there was no sign of anyone when the dust settled. With exceptional speed and agility, Feng Hao managed to evade the ferocious attack, distancing himself from the threat of the demon tiger and the pursuing beasts. The demon tiger roared in anger and agony, frustrated by its failed attempt to catch Feng Hao. Feng Hao, while still running, eventually crashed behind a tree. Internally injured and thoroughly exhausted, he was in considerable pain. Jing Yan watched with concern, her worry evident on her face. She asked if Feng Hao was all right, reminding him that they had managed to distance themselves and their pursuers significantly. She urged him to heal his injuries before it was too late quickly. Feng Hao managed a weak response, acknowledging the situation. His eyes shut as his body succumbed to the pain and fatigue. Despite their escape, his injuries continued to take their toll. Jing Yan's distress was evident as she watched Feng Hao pass out from his condition. When Feng Hao regained consciousness, he was wrapped in bandages, his body still aching with pain. His injuries became more apparent, and he was met with a sharp wave of agony. Waking up, Feng Hao experienced pain and voiced his discomfort. After noticing his awakening, Jing Yan visibly relaxed and inquired about his needs. She asked if he was hungry or thirsty and offered him water. Jing Yan hugged Feng Hao tightly, overwhelmed with emotion, expressing her relief that he was awake. While returning the hug, Feng Hao mentioned that he was in pain. Jing Yan playfully punched him in the face, her gesture gentle yet lighthearted. Scattered around them were bones from the demon beasts they had consumed. As Jing Yan ate a piece of demon beast meat, she asked Feng Hao if consuming the meat helped in his healing process. She wondered if all alchemists shared this trait. Feng Hao responded that he needed to figure out other alchemists. He explained that his body's constitution was unique, and the meat of these beasts had a remarkable effect on him. Not only did it strengthen his body, but it also aided in his recovery. Feng Hao admitted that he didn't know if others had the same reaction. Jing Yan quickly assured him that it was unusual, and that she had never seen anything like it. She playfully asked Feng Hao not to keep the red lotus for himself and instead give it to her. In response, Feng Hao took out the Red King Lotus and presented it to Jing Yan. Jing Yan excitedly took hold of it, her happiness evident, and she shared that she always believed she could do it, despite her father's disagreement. Feng Hao chuckled and asked about his share. Jing Yan then broke off a tiny piece of the lotus and offered it to Feng Hao, encouraging him to take it. Observing the situation, Feng Hao remarked that they had managed to turn their misfortune into an advantage with three pieces of the Lotus Kings. Jing Yan curiously asked Feng Hao about his origin again. She then informed him that they had completed her task and that someone would arrive to pick her up in a few days. However, she expressed her reluctance to wait there any longer. Feng Hao agreed, mentioning that he had been away for a few months and should be heading back. He suggested that they explore the area together. Jing Yan agreed, eager to go, and she contemplated that she was starting to understand what kind of family Feng Hao came from. After a few days, Feng Hao was in Yulan City, showing Jing Yan where he lived. Observing this, Jing Yan questioned Feng Hao about his earlier statement that someone in the city wanted to kill him, wondering if he was afraid. Feng Hao replied that his previous self might have been scared, but now it was different. Just then, a rock hit Feng Hao's foot. Jing Yan quickly readied her weapon, becoming alert. Feng Hao also became cautious, and both reacted by attacking in the direction of the rock's origin, a nearby jungle. Three masked assassins emerged from the wilderness, stating that they thought Feng Hao entering the Demon Mountains range was a death sentence for him, yet he survived. One of the masked men commented on Feng Hao's value, and another suggested that they take care of the girl once they were done with him. Feng Hao remained composed, and replied that they didn't need to concern themselves with that, as he'd handle her safety. Jing Yan added that if Feng Hao lost, she wouldn't help him. In response, Feng Hao's anger surged, and he declared that Jing Yan would not be disappointed. The masked man began to criticize Feng Hao's arrogance, but before he could finish, Feng Hao was suddenly behind him. Feng Hao launched a swift attack with incredible speed, slashing the masked man. The strike sliced through the man's shoulder, dividing it into two parts. Feng Hao's eyes emitted an intense, thunderous glare. The other masked men were taken aback, 
pondering if Feng Hao had advanced to a higher martial level. But before they could finish their thoughts, Feng Hao was suddenly right before one of them. He tightly seized both of the man's wrists and swiftly delivered a knee strike to the masked man's face. The blow carried immense force, shattering the man's jaw and breaking his mask into fragments. Witnessing this brutal attack, the remaining masked man began to flee, but Feng Hao was already leaping towards him in an instant. Feng Hao clutched the man's neck and demanded to know who sent them. The masked man pleaded, revealing that it was the Hu family and their master Hu who had hired them for the task. Upon hearing this, Feng Hao swiftly snapped the masked man's neck. As Feng Hao returned to the Feng house, the family members greeted him joyfully. They expressed their amazement that he had become a martial practitioner in just a few months. They admired his exceptional talent, remarking that seeing a 12-year-old at his level was rare. Feng Chen and Feng Hao's mother also joined in, happy to see him. However, Feng Hao felt a sense of remorse for causing his parents to worry. He admitted feeling ungrateful for making them concerned. Feng Chen embraced him, reassuring him that it was all right, and they were relieved he had returned safely. He suggested they go inside to talk and catch up. In the backyard of the auction house, someone discussed Feng Hao's competitive nature. The auction leader conversed with Hu's brother, mentioning that he had warned him before that it might be futile. The auction leader revealed that Feng Hao seemed to have some protection from a mysterious individual, which prevented his demise. This outcome was fortunate for Hu's brother, as it saved him from losing significant money. The auction leader noted that Hu typically succeeded in his bets and advised him to conduct an inventory of medicinal herbs. He suggested that the masked man might come to collect the medicine soon, and this transaction would likely lead to future prosperity. In a different meeting among clan leaders, one expressed frustration over the Feng family's situation. They questioned how Feng Hao had managed to advance so quickly to the fifth stage of the martial apprentice level. The leader of the Yang family added that the Feng family had gained support from the mysterious individual, and Feng Hao had grown stronger during this time. He expressed frustration that Feng Hao had returned without their awareness, indicating their lack of vigilance. The leader questioned whether their families could maintain their reputation in Yulan City's future. He turned to his son Lao Yang, seeking his perspective on the mysterious man. Lao Yang reassured his father, advising him not to worry. He explained that he had deployed spies throughout Yulan City and found no signs of the mysterious man's presence. Lao Yang added that if the mysterious man were present, he would have acted by now. He highlighted that after nurturing a group of mercenaries for so long, the current situation offered the best opportunity to work. Despite the circumstances, Lao Yang firmly believed they would eliminate the Feng clan. Hearing this, Yang expressed his readiness to take action, intending to make Feng Hao a target for his son's anger. Meanwhile, a person rushed to a meeting attended by Feng's elders and leaders at the Feng residence. Upon arrival, the person reported that the Hu and Yang families had gathered more than a hundred people to launch an attack from the rear of the mountain. In response, Feng Lao expressed his anticipation of such an attack and issued orders for the Feng family members. He instructed some to remain behind for defense, while the others followed him to confront the threat at the back of the mountain. Concerned for Feng Hao's safety, Feng Chun asked if Jing Yan should seek cover. Jing Yan confidently responded that there was no need to worry about her, and with Feng Hao by her side, even a martial master was no match for them. Feng Chun was astonished by the pill Jing Yan held, recognizing its potency several times greater than that of a Wu Jing Yan. Feng Hao then urged his father to let go as they had arrived at their destination. Outside, near the mountains, People from the Hu and Yang families had gathered. On the opposite side, Feng Lao raised his voice, expressing disbelief at the audacity of the Hu and Yang families for causing trouble at the Feng Hao residence. He considered their actions as taking things too far, a blatant disregard for respect. Yang responded that when Feng's family had previously bullied them by coming to their doorstep, did Feng Lao think they would accept it without retaliation? Feng Chun retorted that the Hu family's statement was audacious. In a furious state, Feng Chun added that Yang had sent numerous individuals to assassinate Feng Hao secretly. Despite that, Feng's family had not sought revenge, but now the tables had turned, with the attackers coming to their doorstep first. Amidst the chaos, Lao yelled that it was all nonsense and declared that the Feng family must be eradicated that day. He commanded his followers to attack the Feng family with all their might. On the other side, the Feng family also launched a full-force assault. Casualties mounted on both sides as the conflict intensified. The battle raged on, each faction unleashing their strongest attacks against the other. Amidst the clash, Feng Lao engaged with all his power. Seeing his approach, Yang Kui swiftly evaded others to confront Feng Lao directly. Yang prepared to unleash a powerful technique called the Torrential Force Palm on Feng Lao. However, Feng Chun's voice cut through, urging caution. Feng Chun seized Yang's hand, cautioning Lao that he should face a martial master, as he himself was one. Upon witnessing the scene, the Yang leader raised his voice, announcing his intention to join the fight. However, a powerful thunder whip appeared out of nowhere, blocking his path. A voice chimed in, remarking that a two-against-one battle wasn't fair. Jing Yan stood in opposition, challenging the Yang leader's claim to being a patriarch while tarnishing his reputation. Fueled by anger, the Yang leader prepared a palm strike to attack Jing Yan. He released his attack with full force, but Jing Yan swiftly parried it with her whip. 
Astonished by Jing Yan's ability to defend against his attack, the Yang leader acknowledged that she possessed the combat prowess of a martial master. Meanwhile, the Yang leader's gaze shifted to Feng Hao, realizing his identity as an alchemist. He shouted to Hu Ku and Yang Kui, insisting that Feng Hao must be eliminated no matter the cost. After hearing Yang's words, Hu Ku and Yang Kui became excited. They both charged at Feng Hao with tremendous force, their enthusiasm driving their actions. However, Feng Hao remained composed in the face of their attack. He employed his rolling thunder punch with a calculated demeanor, instantly incapacitating both opponents. The sight of their swift defeat left Yang and his son in a state of shock. Feng Hao's confident expression didn't waver as he challenged anyone who dared to oppose him. In a surprising turn of events, Yang knelt on the ground, seemingly defeated, but his anger boiled over and he clenched his fist in frustration. Yang cried out to the Wild Wolves mercenary group, urging them to join the fight and help him eliminate every member of the Feng family. The leader of the Wild Wolves mercenary group responded, expressing regret that they hadn't intervened sooner to prevent the escalation. They acknowledged that their reputation was now at stake and declared their determination to fight rather than suffer the shame of defeat. He added that the Feng family was insignificant, and he alone could handle them all. Witnessing this, Feng Chun shouted that the Yang family had two martial grandmasters and ordered everyone to retreat to the manor. Yang then responded to the mercenary group's leader, encouraging them to carry out the attack and promising them all the money they desired if they succeeded in eliminating the Feng family. Hearing this, the leader of the mercenary group became consumed by greed. He apologized to the members of the Feng family and explained that he couldn't resist the allure of money. Suddenly, without warning, he was in close proximity to Feng Chun, his palm aimed at Feng Chun's chest. The leader launched a powerful strike at Feng Chun's chest, the impact of which was severe, causing Feng Chun to cough up blood. Witnessing this, Feng Hao became worried and urgently called out to his father. Meanwhile, the mercenary leader who had just attacked Feng Chen boasted that he alone could handle the entire Feng family. Suddenly, a powerful thunder whip emerged, seizing the mercenary leader by his arm. He turned to see Jing Yan, who possessed a rare lightning attribute, though her cultivation level appeared low. With her whip firmly gripping the mercenary leader, Jing Yan asked Feng Hao for assistance. Feng Hao, who was by his father's side, received encouragement from Feng Chen to aid Jing Yan. Rising to his feet, Feng Hao accessed the power of his pharmacopoeia. As he activated the pharmacopoeia, Jing Yan was imbued with enhanced capabilities and a surge of energy. Jing Yan gazed at the mercenary leader and declared that he would face the consequences of his actions. Jing Yan swiftly produced a pill, and as she did, her whip's grip on the mercenary leader became even more potent. Suddenly, the whip's power intensified to such an extent that it forcefully tore the mercenary leader's arm in half. He cried for help calling out to Peng Shan and offering him leadership in exchange for assistance. In a surprising turn of events, someone launched a lethal strike at the mercenary leader, ending his life. It was Peng Shan who declared that the leadership role should rightfully have been his, and questioned why he should let someone else claim it. After eliminating the former mercenary group leader, Peng Shan remarked that there would now be more wealth for their group. The other mercenary group members cheered for him, acknowledging him as their new leader. Peng Chen then suggested that there might be different considerations for targeting Jing Yan, given that she could be from a significant family. He proposed that all the wealth of the Hu and Yang families should be surrendered to him, posing the question if anyone had objections. Yang and Hu agreed, stating that the spoils would be his if he triumphed. With a sinister grin on his face, Peng started advancing toward Jing Yan and Feng Hao. His speed was so astonishing that their eyes struggled to track his movements. Feng Hao became aware of his approach and alerted them that he was coming from the right. However, before they could react, Peng abruptly shifted behind Jing Yan, poised to strike her ferociously. Jing Yan turned to see Peng's imposing figure closing in on her with an overwhelming attack. Suddenly, Feng Hao leaped in front of Peng's attack, taking the brunt of the blow with a deafening impact. The forceful strike from Peng propelled Feng Hao into the ground, causing blood to spray upon impact. Seeing this, Jing Yan's face filled with concern as she urgently called out Feng Hao's name. Feng Hao was wounded and coughing up blood as he lay on the ground. Peng was astonished that Feng Hao had survived such a powerful blow. With tears in her eyes, Jing Yan carefully lifted Feng Hao and declared that he couldn't die there. She reminded him of his promise to her, and she was determined not to let him pass away before fulfilling it. Feng Chun, equally worried, raised his voice and called out Feng Hao's name in concern. As the Feng family members looked on, they felt despair as they believed the situation was dire. Meanwhile, Peng stood there with an air of madness about him. The Yang leader's voice rang out, urging Peng to kill Feng Hao first and then wipe out his entire family. He expressed a twisted desire to see Feng Chun suffer the pain of losing his loved ones. Peng responded with a sinister laugh, agreeing to the gruesome request. In a protective stance, Jing Yan stood by Feng Hao's side, shielding him with her arm. As Peng launched an attack on them, a sudden intervention occurred. Someone grabbed Peng's arm, halting his assault. It was an elderly master with a long beard, a figure emanating authority and strength. With a swift motion, the master threw Peng's arm aside, causing him to stagger. Realizing this old man's immense power, Peng understood that he too was a martial grandmaster. Turning his attention to Jing Yan, 
The old master bowed respectfully, apologizing for allowing her to experience suffering. He paid his respects to Jing Yan and admitted his remorse for not intervening sooner. Jing Yan's eyes burned with anger and agony as she commanded the old man to aid her in eliminating their enemies. The old master agreed, his eyes igniting with fiery red energy. Observing this, Peng realized that he might have provoked the wrath of a powerful and influential family's daughter and anticipated a grim fate. Preparing to unleash a spell, he declared that even in death, he'd take them all down with him showcasing the full extent of his destructive power. Amidst the chaos, the other mercenary group members frantically shouted for everyone to flee. Peng had initiated a rampage technique, a devastating force that threatened all living beings in its vicinity. However, their attempts to escape were in vain, as Peng was already enshrouded by the technique's lethal waves, which claimed his comrades' lives. With a final surge of power, Peng directed this destructive force toward the old master, hoping to take him down. The old master skillfully evaded all of the spell waves, maneuvering himself behind Peng. As the waves chased the old master, they inadvertently struck Peng himself, causing him to erupt with energy and let out a scream of agony. Meanwhile, the old master remained composed, positioned just behind Peng with a determined look in his eyes. Peng collapsed to the ground, leaving the onlookers in shock. The members of the Hu family observed that both individuals were at the same level of power, yet a single move was all it took to determine the outcome. Yang urgently commanded his people to retreat, but a swift and powerful force cleaved through them before they could react, bisecting both Yang and Hu members. Witnessing this horrific sight, the remaining members of the Yang and Hu families were gripped by fear. At this point, the old man's anger had reached its peak. He ascended into the air with an overwhelming surge of power. The old man released a powerful energy blast that struck all the members of the Hu and Yang families, leaving them lifeless on the ground. With everyone defeated, the old man approached Jing Yan and reassured her that Feng Hao was only unconscious. He informed her that the patriarch had insisted that Jing Yan return with him since she had completed the task in the Demon Beast's mountains. Gently placing Feng Hao down, Jing Yan went to Feng Chen and handed him some pills, advising him to make sure Feng Hao remembered the promise they made in the Demon Beast's mountain range. Jing Yan and the old man then turned toward their home, leaving the Feng family behind. Feng Chun contemplated the situation as they watched Jing Yan and the old man depart, thinking about the Grandmaster acting as Jing Yan's bodyguard. He pondered whether Jing Yan's family held significant influence and wealth, and wondered if this encounter would ultimately benefit or harm Feng Hao. Feng Lao declared it was time to eliminate the Hu and Yang families. This time, the Feng family successfully eradicated the Hu and Yang families, claiming their wealth and resources. Simultaneously, the Wild Wolves mercenaries, who had a few thousand members, were defeated without resisting. After the conflict, the Feng family emerged stronger than ever, rising victoriously from their challenges. Feng Hao lay in bed, wrapped in bandages. His mother and father were by his side, filled with relief as he woke up. Feng Hao's father advised him not to make any unnecessary movements, since his body was riddled with broken bones. He emphasized the importance of proper rest for a full recovery. Feng Hao then requested some fresh medicinal herbs to eat. This surprised his father, but they quickly fetched the herbs for him. With his mother's help, Feng Hao consumed the herbs, and almost instantly, he began to feel the healing effects. Witnessing this rapid recovery, his father wondered if Feng Hao was an alchemist. On a beautiful morning, Feng Hao lay in the lush green grass beneath a tree, lost in thought about his status as an alchemist. He reflected on how revealing his identity as an alchemist to the public had brought stability to the Feng family in Yulan City. However, he realized that despite this stability, he still lacked the necessary funds to purchase medicinal plants for pill refinement. Filled with concern, Feng Hao sat up and called for little master Lao Lao. Responding to his call, Lao Lao arrived with a hint of annoyance in her tone. She pointed out that with Feng Hao's current abilities, he was at least a high-grade Xuan alchemist, yet he once again found himself short of money. Listening to this, Feng Hao felt embarrassed while sitting there. Lao Lao added that Feng Hao was becoming the embarrassment of the alchemist world. Pulling out a few books, Lao Lao's frustration was evident as she asked if Feng Hao believed secret techniques were just bok choice. She emphasized that all of those techniques were present. Feeling a bit let down, Feng Hao responded that if Lao Lao didn't want to share the techniques, she didn't need to devise random excuses. Later, Feng Hao walked through the city, and people around him recognized him as an alchemist, praising him for transforming Yulan City. However, amidst this recognition, Feng Hao was lost in thought, pondering how other alchemists had people eager to offer money for their services. At the same time, he struggled to find the medicinal ingredients he needed. Feng Hao then recalled a place where he knew some excellent medicinal ingredients could be found. He headed to the auction house, and upon reaching the entrance, he met the receptionist. She warmly greeted Feng Hao, who explained that he was there to convey a message. He was representing his master to collect some medicinal ingredients. The receptionist guided him to the back of the house, 
In the rear area, Feng Hao encountered the leader of the auction house, Peng, who told Feng Hao to wait briefly as the ingredients were ready for collection. With a smile, Feng Hao remarked that the quality of the ingredients should be decent, otherwise, he wouldn't be interested in them. The leader assured Feng Hao that there was no need to worry, as the ingredients would all be top grade. Feng Hao contemplated that if he had to pay for them, he could use the black hooded man's identity to have Peng provide them without cost. After a while, the ingredients were brought to Feng Hao. Peng presented them to him, mentioning that they were a gift from Yaiwe Auction House. Feng Hao's excitement peaked as he saw the array of ingredients, and his eyes lit up with anticipation. He thought that he could now embark on his training journey with these ingredients. While carrying the components, Feng Hao bid Peng and her assistant farewell, leaving the auction house. The assistant lady remarked that those were valuable materials, and Peng gave them to Feng Hao for free. Peng responded that several hundred thousand gold tails worth of medicinal ingredients wasn't significant for their auction house. As they walked away, Peng noted that investing in a future Xuan grade alchemist was worthwhile. Now at the Feng family's martial arts training ground, young students diligently practice their martial arts. Observing the students, Feng Hao reflected that if he hadn't chosen the path of martial arts, he might have been in the same position as these students, engaged in ordinary activities, living a life of mediocrity, and unaware of the larger world. Feng Hao contemplated that, in a harsh reality, lacking power meant having nothing, not even respect. As Feng Hao gazed at the sky, an eagle caught his attention as it soared. The eagle swiftly hunted down another bird, prompting Feng Hao to contemplate that even one's life required power. With determination, Feng Hao stood up and asserted that he must make his mark on this world. With resolve, Feng Hao took action. Retrieving a dagger from his cuffs, he gathered his whole strength and hurled it, declaring it was time to venture out and explore. The spinning blade embedded itself in a map, precisely striking the location of Red Sun City. Feng Hao's realization was evident as he uttered that he was heading to Red Sun City. After five days the sun began to set, casting a beautiful orange hue across the surroundings. Feng Hao stood near a city stone with the words Green Crowtown carved. He acknowledged that he had reached a city. Walking through the bustling city market, he observed the lively activity among traders. Feng Hao pondered how a town this minor could have such thriving businesses and numerous traveling merchants. This realization struck him. The people here had become accustomed to the presence of merchants. Suddenly a thought dawned on Feng Hao. He realized that he might be in the Hundred Thieves City. This city was a definite stop for anyone traveling to Red Sun City. It became clear to him that this was the route he must take. According to rumors, Green Crow Town had gained a reputation for housing more than a hundred thieving gangs. Traveling merchants passing through the town without proper guards or the ability to pay a hefty ransom faced dire consequences. Feng Hao realized that venturing through the Hundred Thieves City without precaution was risky. To ensure his safety, he considered joining a group. As Feng Hao observed the surroundings, he noticed a crowd gathering around an announcer. The announcer was inviting people to join the Golden Wind mercenaries, mentioning that they were recruiting new members and offering substantial rewards for those who succeeded. When observing the situation and listening to the announcement, Feng Hao saw a chance before him. The emblem of the Golden Wind mercenaries was proudly displayed and swaying in the breeze. A person beside the logo, holding some documents, addressed the gathered crowd. He shared that the Golden Wind mercenaries had landed a significant contract, but their workforce needed increased. As a result, they were currently recruiting a hundred temporary members. The man explained that those interested could sign up for this opportunity. Each participant would be rewarded with a thousand gold tails after completing the task. The crowd became animated upon hearing this, discussing how generous the offer was coming from the mercenaries. Another person among the onlookers mentioned that the group's leader held the rank of a martial grandmaster, ensuring that following closely behind them guaranteed safety during the mission. Amidst the enthusiastic chatter, one person in the crowd exclaimed that they should stop standing around and instead register. The crowd responded by raising their hands, showing their eagerness to participate. Meanwhile, Feng Hao remained in his spot, contemplating that joining the Golden Wind mercenaries could make traversing the Hundred Thieves City less daunting. Suddenly, a commotion arose as a person was forcefully thrown to the ground, creating a loud impact. Another burly individual approached the fallen person, mocking them for being an early-stage martial practitioner and implying that their standards must be pretty low. The hefty man proceeded to kick the person on the ground. Witnessing this, Feng Hao felt a desire to intervene and say something. The big man challenged the crowd, inquiring if anyone else wanted to try it. Responding to this, one person from the group mentioned that the minimum requirement had been raised due to the high number of people registering. Only those with the power of a high-grade martial practitioner should attempt it. Amidst the murmurs, Feng Hao stepped forward and expressed his intention to try. The burly man looked at him with confusion, questioning if it was indeed Feng Hao who wanted to attempt the registration. He chuckled, remarking about Feng Hao being young and inexperienced as if the place belonged to him. The laughter from the crowd continued, with people teasing Feng Hao calling him a baby and suggesting he should go back to drinking milk rather than attempting the challenge. Nonetheless, Feng Hao remained composed and pointed out that he hadn't even tried yet, 
questioning how everyone could be so sure of his abilities. The burly man overseeing the trials commented that it appeared Feng Hao wouldn't back down unless he faced a challenging situation. He proposed a deal. If Feng Hao could withstand three of his attacks, he'd let him proceed. Full of confidence, Feng Hao suggested pushing it to ten moves instead. After Feng Hao's confident challenge, the big man's ego swelled, and he eagerly accepted, warning that he wouldn't hold back against a child. With a powerful punch, the big man lunged toward Feng Hao, his fist nearing its target. Despite the impending blow, Feng Hao remained composed, showing no sign of fear. Suddenly, he executed a swift defensive maneuver, countering the big man's attack with a punch of his own. The collision generated a burst of energy, sending waves rippling through the ground. Their clash forced the big man to stumble back, his blow redirected. As smoke wafted from his hand, the big man overseeing the challenge realized that Feng Hao possessed unexpected strength. The group leader approached from behind and appraised Feng Hao, acknowledging his qualification. Feng Hao expressed his gratitude. The leader, munching on an apple, observed that it was unusual to encounter someone so young with such a high cultivation level and a composed demeanor during the conflict. He realized that Feng Hao was far from ordinary. Now, the Golden Wind mercenaries were marching together as a group. Riding a horse, the leader conversed with an older man in the horse room. He reassured the older man that there was no need to worry, as they'd recruited an additional hundred members this time. The leader believed that the bandits wouldn't dare to block their path with this strengthened force. The older man, Fei, responded positively, stating that their main goal was safely reaching Red Sun City, where a substantial reward awaited them. Feng Hao observed the caravan and noted that although it wasn't huge, it had hired several hundred guards. He realized that this journey was no ordinary one. As night fell, the stars twinkled in the sky, illuminating the camps of both the merchant caravans and the mercenaries. Amid this, Feng Hao was busy cooking some meat for himself. He reflected that he was fortunate to possess a unique storage ring. Not only could he store a considerable amount of demon beast meat, but it also provided him warmth during the night. Suddenly, Feng Hao became aware of someone approaching from behind. When he turned around, he saw a little girl who addressed him as Big Brother. Curious, Feng Hao asked her who she was and she introduced herself as Fei. Fei appeared hungry and eager to eat the meal that Feng Hao had prepared. Feng Hao kindly advised Fei to eat slowly, assuring her that there was plenty of food for her. Fei expressed her satisfaction with the delicious grilled meat, stating she was complete. Feng Hao then offered her a handkerchief, suggesting she wipe her face to remove the stains resembling a cat's whiskers. While Feng Hao was handing Fei the handkerchief, someone suddenly appeared and swiftly grabbed her before him. Feng Hao was taken aback by how quickly Fei disappeared, and was left confused and puzzled by the sudden events. Then, to Feng Hao's surprise, he noticed Fei standing behind him with an older man. The man addressed Fei as, Younger Miss, and questioned why she had ventured so far. Fei explained that she was feeling hungry and went out to find food. The older man responded that she was causing him stress as she approached random people whenever she was hungry. Feng Hao intervened, explaining that he had invited Fei to share his meal, and asked if there was any issue. The older man, seemingly wary, questioned Feng Hao's identity while preparing a spell in his hand. Remaining calm, Feng Hao introduced himself as a temporary member of the Golden Wind Group. Upon hearing Feng Hao's response, the older man expressed his approval, and instructed Feng Hao to wait until he confirmed with Huang Meng about his membership in the group. With that, the older man gently led Fei away. Fei addressed him as Grandpa, and assured him that Feng Hao was not the wrong person. Observing this interaction, Feng Hao deduced that the older man must possess formidable strength, likely that of at least a martial grandmaster. Feng Hao considered the older man's guarded demeanor, and realized that what he was safeguarding wasn't mere possessions, but Fei herself. Three days passed, and the forest was bathed in the warm sunlight. Fei's voice chimed in, inviting the older man to come and enjoy a meal. Once again, Feng Hao was busy cooking demon beast meat while Fei stood by his side. The older man declined the offer, stating that he had already eaten. Lost in his thoughts, he gazed in another direction. Unexpectedly, Fei playfully pushed the meat into the older man's mouth, insisting he should taste the delicious food Feng Hao had prepared. With a surprised expression, Feng Hao held Fei as she fed the older man, praising the taste of the meat. The older man eventually thanked Feng Hao and took his heart. Suddenly, screams echoed from the nearby camps causing Feng Hao to become alarmed. He turned to the older man, seeking answers but unsure of what was happening. The older man headed towards the camps to investigate, instructing Feng Hao to stay with Fei. As the older man reached the campsite, he found men poisoned, realizing that a poison master must be involved. Meanwhile, Fei rushed ahead to gather information, and the older man told Feng Hao to protect her in his absence. Feng Hao assured him it was manageable, since the poison wasn't too severe, and could be treated quickly. The mercenary leader was incapacitated somewhere within the camp, Confronted by a man brandishing a sword, the leader accused Huan Mong of betrayal, but Huan Mong retorted that receiving money for his actions was a good enough reason to do so. He kicked the leader and held his sword menacingly, saying he wouldn't hold back even against his brother once the leader fell. The leader lamented his decision to bring in someone driven by greed as his comrade. Huan Mong then prepared to strike with his sword, aiming to end the leader's life. But suddenly, his sword was deflected by a powerful force. The sword fell to the ground. 
and the man behind the intervention was revealed to be the older man, Fei. He questioned Huan Mang about who sent him on this mission. Suddenly, Huan Mang leaped up and started running, laughing as he promised they'd find out the truth soon. The older man, Fei, tried to chase after him, but the mercenary leader held him back. The leader firmly grasped Fei's clothes and advised him to stop pursuing Huan Mang. While lying down, the leader apologized, acknowledging that Huan Mang's betrayal had shattered their trust. He expressed that he didn't regret facing death, but lamented the trouble he had caused young Miss Fei. Unexpectedly, they heard a voice proclaiming the ability to cure the poison. The leader was taken aback by this declaration, looking astonished at the speaker. To their surprise, Feng Hao claimed to have the solution. With Fei by his side, Feng Hao approached them confidently. The leader asked Feng Hao if he could cure poisons, to which Feng Hao confirmed he could as an alchemist. The revelation that he was an alchemist surprised everyone. Feng Hao then placed his palm on the leader's body, causing him to start coughing out the poison. After a moment, the leader fully recovered, mentioning that even the Wu Yuan in his body had been restored. He bowed before Feng Hao with gratitude, who humbly suggested that he didn't need to do so since the leader was their group leader. Feng Hao then walked alongside older man Fei and the leader, emphasizing that they shouldn't waste any more time and should start healing the rest of the members. Feng Hao arranged all the members in a circle and emitted a healing wave that impacted everyone. The members began coughing as the poison was expelled from their bodies. All the members bowed to Feng Hao and expressed gratitude for his assistance. As they gathered together, the leader questioned who might be responsible for the attack. Feng Hao suggested a strategy of turning the tables on the attackers. He proposed making the attackers think everyone in the mercenary group was dead, luring them into a trap. They agreed with the plan and followed Feng Hao's lead. They lay on the ground, pretending lifeless and waiting for the enemies to take the bait. In a different location, within a desert, the wind was blowing heavily around a mysterious figure. Mong entered a cave nestled between mountains, encountering two guards who blocked his path. He informed them that he had an urgent message from Yuan Hua of the Golden Wind mercenaries for their leader, Boss Xing. The guards allowed him to proceed, and Mong entered the cave. Inside, he shared the entire situation with Xing, who appeared pleased to hear that everyone was presumed dead. Xing then handed Mong a potion, which Mong quickly consumed. However, instead of relief, the potion causes Mong to become furious and scream in agony. He collapsed to the ground in pain. Xing calmly explained that the brew only temporarily alleviated the pain and revealed that Yang had yet to complete the task. Xing said that the natural antidote would only be given once Mong brought the young girl to him, and he advised Mong to gather a group to retrieve her. Mong began to express concern, but Xing interrupted him, assuring him he would provide Chai and his group to accompany him. With gratitude, Mong departed while thanking Xing. As Mong left, Xing chuckled revealing his disregard for Mong and his intentions. As night fell, everyone remained motionless near the camp, feigning death. Mong reappeared, this time accompanied by Chai and his companions. Chai queried Mong about the presence of a solitary martial grandmaster in the group. Mong confirmed that the others should already be deceased. Chai initiated their task, emphasizing that completing it would secure their antidote. He expressed his regret for betraying his brother, and Mang explained that his desperate need for treatment left him with no alternative. As the mercenaries lying down started to rise, Chai observed two figures near a campfire. He questioned Mang about his earlier assertion of only one martial grandmaster. Feng Hao noticed their presence and greeted them. Chai reassured his companions, stating there was no need to fear, as the individuals were just older men and young boys, unlikely to pose a threat. This prompted a confident smile from Feng Hao, as he questioned the validity of Chai's assumption. Chai was taken aback and impressed by Feng Hao's composed demeanor. Meanwhile, Mong was surprised to see his brother alive and well. The leader of the mercenaries acknowledged Yuan's efforts in luring out the attackers. Chai questioned Yuan Mong, suggesting he had set the trap, but Yuan denied involvement. Suddenly, blood splattered as Chai swiftly slashed Mong's neck. Simultaneously, the enraged older man Fei wielded his sword with great power and demanded to know who sent them. Chai suggested that since they were all destined to die in this confrontation, they might as well go out and enjoy the battle. The two groups charged at each other, and swords clashed as the war commenced. Soon, Chai and his group found themselves defeated, with mercenaries and merchants holding swords to their throats. The older man Fei asked if they would reveal who sent them, promising to spare their lives. Sitting on the ground with Fei's foot on him, Chai was coughing up blood. He declared that no one was behind them, and urged Fei to go ahead and kill him. The group leader suggested to the older man Fei that they wouldn't talk and should be killed. Fei agreed with a nod, ready to strike his sword. However, Feng Hao intervened and stopped Fei. He approached Chai, sitting beside him while lost in thought. Concerned, the leader warned Feng Hao to be careful, explaining that Chai ranked among the top ten robbers. The leader observed Feng Hao's actions and cautioned him about Chai's reputation. Feng Hao noticed a greenish smoke coming from Chai's wound and realized he had been poisoned. This revelation surprised Chai, who asked how Feng Hao could have known. Feng Hao explained that his suspicion was correct. Chai must have been compelled to come here against his will. Chai's screams filled the air as he implored Feng Hao to end their suffering quickly, now that everyone knew the truth. Feng Hao, however, did something unexpected. He touched the blood-stained ground. 
With a curious expression, he brought the blood to his nose and took a deep smell. Then, he explained to Chai how he deduced that the scent of blood drove the elaborate poisoning. Feng Hao contemplated that the poison was incredibly complex, likely involving over a hundred components. An ordinary poison master couldn't have concocted such an intricate blend. As he sniffed again, he recognized that within this poison, there was an element with medicinal properties that counteracted the poison's effects and slowed its spread. Feng Hao realized that the poison master behind their predicament must have employed this method to control Chai and his group. The leader praised Feng Hao for his swift recognition of the poison's effects. Feng Hao further reflected that the quality of this poison indicated it was beyond the capability of an average poison master. He compared the previous poison affecting Yuan Hua, something a typical mid-grade poison master could create, to Chai's venom, which required the skill of an advanced Zhuan-grade poison master. This insight led Feng Hao to surmise that Fei's identity was more complex than it seemed. Feng Hao then shared with the group that he could cure this poison. Chai and the others were amazed by this revelation, their astonishment evident. Feng Hao swiftly extended his healing arm and pressed it against Chai's back. Chai began to expel blood and coughed intensely. After a while, Feng Hao inquired about Chai's condition. Chai, clearly affected by Feng Hao's intervention, respected him and earnestly requested his help, referring to Feng Hao as an alchemist. Seated across from Chai, Feng Hao assured him he could assist, but he required Chai to reveal who sent them honestly. Amidst the scene, a campfire crackled, casting warm light as meat cooked over it. Feng Hao, the leader, and old Fei gathered around the fire, with Feng Hao enjoying a meal and a drink. The leader pondered aloud, questioning how individuals like Chai could willingly become puppets, if not for the poison. Old Man Fei suggested they must thoroughly address this issue, and it was time for them to proceed. Chai's voice pierced the air as night fell between two mountains, alerting Feng Hao and his companions to the nearby cave. Suddenly, swiftly and quietly, ninjas materialized before the cave entrance. Chai halted Feng Hao and his group, pointing towards a figure. Xing sent Chai on this dangerous path, surrounded by his ninjas as protection. Xing locked eyes with Chai, his gaze filled with hatred and anger. He taunted Chai, insinuating that he no longer wanted to live. Chai countered, clarifying that his intent wasn't to give up on life, but to end Xing's. In a decisive move, Xing commanded his ninjas to attack, prompting them to lunge toward Feng Hao and his companions. In a swift and skilled motion, Chai drew his sword and struck down the three ninjas who had attacked him. Blood stained his sword as the fallen ninjas lay lifeless on the ground. This display of lethal prowess left Xing shocked and bewildered, struggling to understand the situation. Xing's mind raced as he realized that Yuan's group, despite his belief that they had perished, were not only alive but seemingly unharmed. This revelation shook him to his core. Fear and disbelief took hold of Xing's thoughts as he contemplated the possibility of a skilled pharmacist among them, capable of countering the effects of the poison. Chai took advantage of this moment to boldly declare they had a pharmacist who could cure the poison. With this newfound ally, Chai asserted that they no longer needed to fear the traitor, referring to Xing who once held power over them. Chai brandished his sword, directing it menacingly towards Xing, and commanded his companions to converge on Xing to subdue him. Unexpectedly, Xing's condition took a sudden turn for the worse. He started to expel blood from his mouth, collapsing to the ground in agony. A sense of confusion pervaded the scene as everyone witnessed this abrupt change. Amid the chaos, Feng Hao approached Xing to assess the situation. Smoke billowed from Xing's visage, prompting Feng Hao to deduce that Xing had resorted to taking his own life by consuming poison. Despite the sinister nature of his act, Feng Hao conceded that it was a shrewd move on Xing's part. The group gathered in the daylight as the day unfolded and the sun rose. Feng Hao found himself at the center of attention as each member respected him in gratitude. Their voices united in thanks for his instrumental role in saving their lives. This newfound alliance extended further as they expressed their willingness to follow and serve Feng Hao with honor. Upon hearing the overwhelming show of loyalty, Feng Hao contemplated the practicality of having so many followers accompany him on his journey. A solution presented itself as he recalled the needs of Yulan City. Addressing the group, he invited them to rise and proposed an alternative. He suggested those who genuinely wished to join him could venture to his family's abode in Yulan City. By mentioning his name, they would find themselves comfortably settled there. Directing his words to Chai, Feng Hao offered an option to depart if he desired. After a span of nine days, the landscape was adorned with the brightness of the sun. The caravan progressed steadily, comprising Fei's cart and horse, under the clear sky of a sunny day. The leader questioned Feng Hao, wondering if the master pharmacists still required protection now that they had ventured into the Hundred Thieves' domain. Feng Hao responded that security was optional, as he planned to travel alongside the caravan to Qiang City. He entrusted the entire group with the responsibility of ensuring the Feng family's safety in Yulan City. Feng Hao was curious about Fei's background and her origins within the caravan. To the leader's surprise, Feng Hao was unaware of Fei's identity. Feng Hao reiterated his lack of knowledge, prompting the leader to reveal that Fei was the youngest daughter of the prestigious Fei family, one of the three prominent families in Qiang City. The caravan and Feng Hao arrived at the city gate a day later. Looking at the city's beauty, Feng Hao remarked that it was pretty impressive and had an elegant charm. He contrasted it with Yulan City, which he found colder and more focused on cultivation. Fei, 
also in the cart, asked if they were finally home. Old Fei extended an invitation to Feng Hao, suggesting that he visit their house first. Although surprised, Feng Hao agreed after Fei insisted. At the Fei residence, Fei introduced Feng Hao to her father. Old Man Fei respectfully bowed to Fei's father and reported the successful completion of their mission. Fei's father acknowledged the accomplishment, and other members of the Fei family also commended Butler Fei for his efforts. Later, Fei's father noticed Feng Hao and inquired about his identity. Feng Hao respectfully greeted Fei's father. As night fell, everyone gathered at the Fei residence. Fei's leader asked old Fei if Feng was a pharmacist and whether he was the one who saved Fei and the entire group by detoxifying the poison. Old Fei confirmed that it was true, and without Feng Hao's help, he believed they wouldn't have escaped the Hundred Thieves domain. Leader Fei commented that if that was the case, Feng Hao must already be a low-level Xuan grade martial master. He marveled that a small city like Yulan could produce a Xuan grade pharmacist like Feng Hao. He continued by instructing them to establish a strong relationship with the Feng family and to assist them in their ascent. Old Fei asked Leader Fei if the matter of the poison master had been resolved. Leader Fei responded that there weren't many families in Chuang City capable of such actions. He added that the Pu family had already declined, leaving only the Ju family. This time the Ju family competed fiercely with the Fei family for the city lord position. Leader Fei expressed his frustration by hitting his hand on the desk. As he gazed out of a window at the setting sun, he lamented that fate seemed to favor the other side despite their efforts. He resolved that in the battle for the city lord position, he would make sure the Ju family understood the strength of the Fei family. He remarked on the missed opportunity, mentioning that they couldn't even capture an unarmed girl. Don't forget to like and comment for the next part. Join our Discord for the name of the book and subscribe for more videos from us.